Is it recording? It, it is. It is recording. It. The woman is. The woman spoke to me. <laughs> All right. Here we are recording. on the blind man. What's that? Recording in process. That's what she said. <laughs> All right. Here we are on the blind man in black. I am your host, Brian Snyder. If you enjoy this, uh, please rate, review, like, subscribe. It really helps. And thank you. So everybody, I am. I am immensely excited. Uh, because we have actor, producer, director, friend, Alan Loiza. Loiza. Did I say that right? I always, I always worried I'm going to say it wrong. You, you Alan know, Loiza. That, that has been going on for a long time. And in fact, I've told people the wrong pronunciation for a long time. And Oh, really? Yeah. Well, it, the thing is, is like Americans call it, Lo, it's Loiza to them, but it is Loiza. Yeah. So, I, I was thinking about it because I used to say Loiza. Yeah. When we were at Cal Arts together, yeah. but I'm like, that's not right. I'm like, it should be Loiza. <laughs> it, it is Loiza. It's Loiza. Yeah. yeah. So I think it's it's how you want to pronounce a y. You know, right. it depends on the region of your of where you grew up. And if you're gonna say i or a or anything else, I think that's 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 kind of where it came from. And I didn't care beforehand, and now it's probably like you should have cared. You should have corrected people. Get them to say your name right. You know. And right. Right. Well, I, I was funny because I, I was, uh, I was thinking about it and I'm like, I, I know, okay. I know it. It's, I, I know I used to say Loiza, but I'm going to say it right. And I still fucked it up. And well, so. I think, I think it's, I think it was Sarah Wilson's fault. I think we could blame her because you know, oh, really? she, she did the Loiza Lacraza for a while there. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know she said that. That was a Lecraza, thing. Lacraza came from her, I believe. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Now, did you did you do something crazy to, to warrant that title? What La Craza? Yeah. I think we all did a little bit of crazy in Cal Arts. I don't know. <laughs> I mean, I, I I think I might have popped crazy a few times, and uh, you know, um, I don't know what it was. Sarah and I knew each other for a long time. We knew each other in high school. So, um, and it was just kind of random and, and wild that we saw each other there. So we, we bonded even more while we were at school. So I did not remember that connection. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Sarah Wilson and I did speech, uh, in high school and we were at competing schools. Um, but our schools were kind of like, you know, we, we did it a lot and we competed a lot and we saw each other all the time. And Sarah and I were both in the same, uh, comedy categories, which was just doing a 10 minute cutting of a play. Okay. And, and then we would, uh, we competed against each other and made it to finals a few times. So I, we were friends. Uh, both of our schools were friends. And I actually ended up going to prom with Sarah at her prom because we we got so close and friendly. And everybody was like, you got to go with Sarah. Please go with Sarah. Like, please come to our prom. And I did. And it was, it was a great time. So Red did you date? Was that was that a thing for a while? No, not at all. Not at all. It was just it was prom? It was just, a, it was just a friendly gesture because, you know, I was really close friends with everybody and uh and she needed a date and nobody from her school was going with her and all of that and we we were all friends so there was that but then I think for a few years you may have a vague memory and maybe not but Sarah would tell everybody that we were with like we went to prom together you know and she would walk away like she would lean in to some <laughs> conversation that I was having with somebody else and she would just you know interject so <laughs> Oh, oh, that's awesome. Uh, for those listening and uh, watching, Sarah Louise Wilson is in a previous episode, and I'm sorry, I don't remember the, the number, but it was probably like maybe six or seven, somewhere in there. Of So if you want a, a, a reference to Sarah Louise Wilson, she's a she's an actor, director, producer as well, and she went to CalArts with us, so you can watch that episode. It's an early one. Like, I'm sorry, I don't remember the number, Sarah, but it's a wonderful episode. Yes. Well, so that's where that came from. And then, um, and yeah, we met, we met at CalArts, Brian. We did. We'll, we'll get into that. But, you know, I want to say you were, I was, you were saying about uh, 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 the little crazy thing. <laughs> and I, what I want to say is what I, re my memory of you is that you are very like level-headed, <laughs> always generally calm, very good with um, relations, meeting people and, uh, and uh, yeah, I, I don't, I don't remember you upset or disturbed or, you know, the usual actor stuff. Yeah. Yeah. I don't think that really applies to me generally. Um, right. Yeah. I, I think I'm always kind of just 
you know what it is i think too much <laughs> so right. I kind of i you know i try to understand how things connect and how people are and i think the more you know the more you learn the more it's it's less of a mystery and less of a you know what's going on here you know less of that kind of um jittery nervousness but um i have nerves i also just have a good poker face at times too so that right. might, that might have been it but um i feel like you know part of it's linked to you know my you know and not to get too too down in the uh, in the weeds here but you know when i was younger I, my brother passed away and i feel like i grew up super fast at that point and I kind of have always uh just kind of felt like everything else in life is easier than that so i was like whatever like i didn't let things bother me so much because i, I kind of went through the worst of it already and so what was the age difference and how old were you when it happened? I was 11. We, we were six years apart. He was six oh, years older. That's horrible. Yeah. And that age too, especially yeah. like looking back now, you're just like, oh my God, those are, that's the age that you start to realize you're a person. Yeah. And then, you know, and then that happens. So it's like, oh, okay. Like, uh, this is going to define me for a while. And in fact, it kind of, kind of always does. So, um, that doesn't go away, but, um, I think that was kind of part of it where I was like, I was just enjoying myself so damn much at cal arts I, I i felt like um that was vacation in a sense because yeah you know yeah. just because going through that but also high school was very academic for me and um and i was doing speech and drama at the same time and um and i was you know we were doing competitions and things like that and it was like that tasted so good to me all mm -hmm. of just just performing and rehearsing and working things out but then I was in a humanities magnet, so I was just like writing papers all the time on mm. on all kinds of stuff. And it was amazing. Uh, it was an amazing education that I feel like has shaped a lot of the political stuff that I'm into now. But mm. but like um, at the time I was when I was done and we were just writing essay after essay, college essays and, you know, 13 pages of handwriting over a two hour period with no notes. And at that point, I was like, hey, can I just act? for a bit. Can I, can I take a vacation from this? I'm not ready for academia. I'm not ready for that. I'm, I need mm. to go explore the thing that I know I love the most. So by the time I got to Cal Arts, it was just like, uh, this, is this, is this real? Is this like really a thing that we could do? Right. Right. Yeah. I mean, it was, it was wild. It was a lot of fun. Yeah. Um, but I wanted to ask you, you said you think a lot <laughs> now when you were in Lou Palter's acting class, <laughs> did he ever say to you, you mind fucking yourself. I I had gotten that once. Yep, yep. Uh, gr crazy thing. I took Lou's class. Lou is still teaching, Brian. I know. And I, I know. I took his class with Craig. About uh, it's now been about a year and a half now, two years, and I think they're still doing it. They're still going. Yeah. And Lou's just as sharp. He's, he's yeah, doing. yeah. I spoke with him in January. He's uh, he's doing okay. You know, you know what happened, right? I don't. Nance passed away, his wife. Oh, God. Yeah. Yeah. I think that happened in like either the end of November. Yeah. I think it was around November. Oh, boy. Yeah. All yeah. Right. Uh, yeah. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to have to disclose that okay. here, but, uh, but yeah. you know, I, she was in class with us. We, we, we bonded very much. And in fact, um, it's funny, I sold my car and didn't have a car for the last year and a half, I think that while I was in LA, which is mm -hmm. crazy. How did you do that? I had a, I had one job, one bus away. Yes. I took a bus in Los Angeles, everybody. No shame in that. No shame. Okay. No shame. Were um, there a lot of pea seats? There was, yeah, it was intense at times. Some, some See, that, that's the thing. I'm fucking blind. And that's why I don't want to go on the bus because I'm like, I'm going to fucking sit in a puddle of pee. I know it. No, I think, I think <laughs> it wasn't that bad, but it was just like, you know, it's, it's a gamble. And, and, you know, I, yeah. I'm, I'm aware of my surroundings and could kind of see danger coming. So it, right. it, it wasn't that bad, but there would be moments where you're like, ah, oh, we, we got to fix this country, man. Um, <laughs> got to help people. But yeah, yeah. But, yeah. you know, uh, but that that said we were driving home i would hitch a ride because i actually lived a few blocks away from them and i would hitch a ride home uh and lou was driving and he drove us and nan would sit in the back and we would talk about 
everything. And Aww. she was just amazing. So, wow. Yeah, she was she was a, a very wonderful woman. And uh, they were together for like 60 years. Yeah. That's that's yeah. that's incredible. Um, unbelievable. And they loved the hell out of each other. It was. Yeah. Just, it yeah. was just so beautiful and um yeah that banter oh my gosh i'm 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 not going to i'm not going to forget that because i i was fresh in class with nick so wow um she was taking class with us she was it was so cute she would get frustrated because she would uh, she would not remember her lines and we're like you guys are very old like these are very dense pieces of of drama that craig and lou are picking i mean of course they're picking the most dramatic shit possible yeah and, it's like the most hard hitting stuff and, and big chunks and, and things like that. So she's frustrated, but nobody cared, you know, it was class. Yeah. She was doing amazing. So she's incredible too, as an actress, just unbelievable. So, yeah. Yeah. yeah I, I have memories of her too. When she came to see our, um, showing of Mara Saad. Yeah. Oh. She was really supportive and sweet and yeah. lovely. Yeah. Lovely person. Lovely yeah. person. Great people. So okay. let's go back to the genesis of Alan Loaiza. See, I, I still fuck it up. To, I mean, I'm getting to, nervous about it. Well, I don't know don't why I can't to, fucking say it. <laughs> well, you don't have to say za. It's just, uh, it's Loaiza. I know. It's Loaiza. I, that was like, to compensate for the, the <laughs> I, and I, I went into the, I don't know what's wrong with me. Loaiza. I have problems. <laughs> so let's start from the beginning. So what? how was your, I mean, we know one part of your childhood, but how was everything else? What did your parents do? Uh, my, my dad is a, my dad's a civil engineer. Um, I'm first generation, uh, from basically South and Central America. So okay, my, my dad is Peruvian and, okay. um, and his mother was an Italian woman whose family grew up basically in Peru. Mm -hmm. So we have some Spanish and Peruvian and some Italian from that side of the family. And then my mom, she's, uh, she's half English, half Spanish. Okay. And she was born in Honduras, lived in Chile and Costa Rica, and then they both met each other in Los Angeles. So they they both moved to Los Angeles, and they and my mom met my my uncle, and that's how she met my dad. Oh so wow! Okay. They're in English school actually in in downtown LA, mm -hmm. and um and then that's how they met, and and uh, and then I grew up in the Valley. I'm an eight one eight kid. <laughs> Where in the Valley? Canoga Park, okay. right in the middle of it. Um, and we lived close to a karate dojo. Did you and, feel like you were in Karate Kid? I mean, it, we were we were completely the demographic for that movie. I mean, right. we were the exact demo. Like we, right. after we got out of that theater and we signed up for karate, like within a week probably. <laughs> so we took karate. Our sensei was actually, actually, I lied. I'm lying right now. That's all right. I'm, I'm at least you're recognizing it. We took karate before the karate kid came out. Right. And then karate kid came out and our sensei was a, was a background in the finals where everybody's fighting and there's this tracking shot and you're passing by all these fights and our sensei was in there. And then the referee at the end with the mustache, who was like, you know, fight. I remember him very well. He had the red yeah. shirt with the yeah. symbol. Yeah. yeah, and he had that really bushy like mustache, and yeah. um, he lived behind us, so it was like very much, you know. Like, you were like in the movie all the time. Yeah, I mean his his apartment was still intact with the field that the skeletons were chasing him through next to was there undeveloped for years, decades. Really? Yeah, um, and some might actually be there. I don't even know. Um, mm -hmm. I have to go check it out. But that, yeah, that's like. That was that was the 80s. I was a I was an 80s kid in the valley. We had uh, season passes to Universal Studios. Okay. So I had memorized the tram tour, and I started really. I mean, all three of us were were really three brothers. Um, yeah. All three of us were like completely geeked out with Hollywood. Our family wasn't in it, but we were just completely enamored by it and. Mm -hmm. Um, and going there so much, I started caring about like camera tricks and, you know, the special effects and how do they do that? And that kind of, I feel like all of that's just totally now I'm looking back and I'm like, that's, that's, what's defining what I'm doing. And, and I, I'm always looking at that stuff and geeking out on 
behind the scenes stuff and uh, and everything else. So that's one side of it. And then, you know, and then we started, uh, I actually should go back even further. I was born and then we moved to Saudi Arabia. What is that about? <laughs> uh, my dad, my dad's company, Ralph M. Parsons Corporation, the, the company he worked at, um, people might recognize them. They, they used to be sponsors on NPR stories and, and they still might be actually, it's been a while. Okay. Um, and uh, they're a big engineering firm and they got hired to basically build a city and a ship port to ship out the oil that was on the East Coast, but they would pump it to the West Coast and then uh, ship it out of the Red Sea and into the Mediterranean. So um, that was it, oil, yay, <laughs> fucking oil. Um, so that's why we were there. And, um, and what was funny was is all the British companies that were there mm -hmm. uh, and the British people that were there, they brought their families and theater with them. So oh, we, really? had, we had this community theater going on and the very first play I ever saw was Oliver Twist when I was about four and a half, five years old. My two brothers were pickpocket orphans um, <laughs> on stage and I was just, I, I sat there just completely wide-eyed the whole time front row while my mom was doing makeup in the back with you know the other moms and and all of that and it was uh that was the beginning of it and and actually that director was incredible and he was a he was a gay man in saudi directing us like as as amazing gay theater directors do you know mm -hmm. and he it was actually i look back at that now it's like how did that happen because we all knew um yeah but you know it, it, he he was there and he ended up directing amazing productions that I look back at it now. I was like, wow, that was community theater in Saudi Arabia. What was that about? Um, now you were, I'm assuming that you were in a compound that you could not leave. Right. So it was a little, um, it wasn't like that entirely. The mm -hmm. entire city that we lived in, I, I would say, I actually don't really know the size of it anymore, mm -hmm. or maybe I never did. Uh, but it was, it was several neighborhoods. I would say like five or six neighborhoods, each neighborhood had its own like track design, mm -hmm. but there were no gates. It was wide open, but it was definitely the, the city for where all the Westerners lived. I see. Okay. So, um, all the Europeans and Americans were living there. And then when we would go into town, uh, yes, the ladies would have to cover up. No women were allowed to drive. Mm -hmm. Um, and I think think that was the most of what I saw of it and what you know they shared with us of like in terms of what we could and couldn't do and all of that but for the most part we were bailing them out with you know building these services and and a way for them to to ship their oil out so I think they kind of gave a little bit more of a pass to that whole community and the whole town it's called Yenbu and it's on the north west coast of Saudi okay uh, and that was it so so but, was yeah. was that the play that like you're like I'm doing this? Yep, that was wow. basically it. And then after that, we did. No, hold on, with hold on a second. What was it about it that that like mesmerized you or said I I want to do this? Um, you know, my brothers were so good. They were mm -hmm. so good in it. They were so present in it. And it was you know this whole chorus of kids, you know, following around. Uh, what's his name? The character's name? Fagan. I played Fagan in the musical. Fagan, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And the man who played him was just, uh, he was mesmerizing. Yeah. He was, he was completely, uh, you know, he was the he was the ringleader. He was the MC for sure. He was definitely this driving force. And it was completely convincing to me. And um, And I knew they were playing. And we would do that on our own by ourselves anyways. Um, my brother, Tony, who's still around, he's, he's, uh, he was definitely the one that kind of pushed the, our, our brains to think creatively okay, and, and to like make believe at home. So is, is Tony acting now? He, he never got into it. He did it. Okay. A little, he did it a little bit. Got, he actually started at the high school, uh, that I ended up going to. And that was the reason I went to it. Cause he, he was in it there, but, um, yeah, he never, he never really, he's in oil now. He's in oil. He's, <laughs> he's, uh, he's living in a big house in Houston. No, okay. uh, just kidding. No, that's a joke. That's a joke. He's in LA. He's, he's in the Valley. Um, okay. But yeah, I think that 
it was definitely that that um it was a it was such a well costumed and produced production that I thought like oh I can be a part of something so big and so unifying and so you know we were I was talking about this a lot lately about like theater and how everybody needs to do it everybody yeah. needs to take a drama class and do it and there's even that um, documentary about uh, American Idiot the musical and uh, it's with Green Day and what's funny is is that Billy Joe is this like punk rock you know guy who got famous when he was 19 18 whatever mm -hmm. um, you know it's this theater group that's presenting this play to him and they end up agreeing to do it but you see them reluctant because they're these big rock stars who are like you know fucking theater or whatever right mm -hmm. but you know hey maybe we'll make money off this it was kind of they weren't completely in it in the beginning. And then they saw the little rehearsed kind of presentation and they decided to move forward. And at, and the, the main thing takeaway from that doc is how he saw this community, this family. And mm -hmm. there's nothing in the world that is like doing a play with a, a group of people. And, um, and just, you know, the trust that you need from every last person there. Um, yeah. So, I think there, there was something about that and, and also just like playing and being, you know, expressive and big on a stage and people were responding and it was like, wow, okay, that's, that's some fun stuff. And we weren't shy kids. We, we were definitely encouraged to play and perform and dance and, and do stuff like that. We traveled a lot when we were kids and, and, you know, we would go to, you know, I think we were in Rome once and some break dancer was there and, we we got out there and started pop dancing, break dancing, and made this guy all kinds of money, and um, it was awesome, you know. And that was like my parents were always like, "Do that, keep going with that," you know. And they so so they was, encouraged it. They they certainly did. I mean, yeah. they let me go to Cal Arts. So, right. Um, <laughs> um, right. But that was uh that was the beginning of it. That was the beginning of it. So when I got back to LA, um, I kind of always had it in the back of my mind elementary school i think i did frosty the snowman for some christmas pageant thing and uh and were you frosty i was i was frosty man i was frosty. wow i had this like paper mache kind of wreath of white around my face <laughs> <laughs> and uh, how did that feel it it you know you, you've got to live through the pain you got it you know you gotta it's it's for the suffer art. for your art yeah it's for the art so did you what was your did you have a voice no, they were singing the song and I got to skip around like a fool and entertain the crowd while they did that. Oh, OK. And okay. so uh, that was cool. And, there, and you know, the, the thing was, is like the kids started responding to that. Mm. And it was like, oh, this is something people enjoy a lot. And it comes kind of easy to me. I just do it, whatever. Mm. So, you know, kind of started that way. And then junior high hit. I think I did like a Romeo and Juliet radio play for drama class there mm -hmm. uh, that's when i really started understanding like oh oh shakespeare okay this is a this is a new wave of things um and we did wizard of oz and i played the scarecrow and um see other. that now that comes back to me i feel was sarah in that sarah was not in that no nobody okay. nobody from cal arts was there yet no. Okay. Uh, she might have done Wizard of Oz on her own. I think we had this conversation once before, and I feel like she played Dorothy once. Okay. Um, okay. I'm not sure though. Um, but yeah, that was uh, that was that was kind of the beginning of it, and it really kind of blew up in high school when uh, when we started doing the speech and debate. Sarah Rosenberg was my drama teacher. She's still crushing it in uh, in New York. Um, really? Okay. Yeah, she she makes people into winners and champions and and successful actors and there's a whole slew of stories behind who she's taught over the years and um and at one point uh we were uh, we were doing a lot of speech and a lot of competitions there was a lot of winning that was happening for for all of us and um and then graduation was looming and and I knew how saturated LA was. And so here comes the calm kind of realistic <laughs> uh, side of me. I, I didn't think I was going to go to theater school because it was so saturated and competitive. And, uh, you know, I was like, maybe I should go to film school, take a year off, 
make a film, go to USC or something. Mm -hmm. And um, and all the other friends of mine that were auditioning to go to Cal Arts, Mike Benson, Zena, Zaffer, okay. and our friend Sean Henry, who you never met. Okay. Um, all three of them said, "No, fuck you. You're gonna audition for this, and you're 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 gonna go in with us." And I mm -hmm. said, uh, "Okay." And I did the audition, and um, and then all four of us got accepted to it. And that was like, then I actually researched a lot more about Cal Arts, and then I realized, oh, I should I should go here. <laughs> right. <laughs> like, yeah, wait. Uh, it, I was really not. I was really not putting my too much of my mind into it when it was happening. I knew it was a big deal. I knew I needed to get the application in. I needed to drive up to Valencia to do the audition for for Cody and Roger, both Hendersons, not not related. Right, and, right. And um, I knew I needed to do that, and I knew I needed to take it serious. And I had my my teacher coach me and and get everything nice and tight and ready. And then um, and then I really researched like, okay, who went here and oh, this is a very hard school to get into. How many people auditioned? Oh God, okay, mm -hmm. I, I gotta do this. Okay, I gotta do this. So, um, and then I kind of changed my, my track to say, you know what, let's do it because this is what you love the most. Stop being realistic, just like go, you know, go learn it, go do it. And I gave myself kind of a timeline after we graduated. Mm -hmm. and, and I'd say, you know, if, if things aren't really completely happening at this point, then you know, get behind the camera and then put yourself in the movies. And, and that was kind of a, it's kind of been like, uh, that was kind of the, the idea. And, and that's, that's how it all started basically. And then, and then we got to CalArts. So what was it about acting that you loved? Like for me, I think about it and I was trying to escape myself you know, or immerse myself in, a, in some other character and yeah. feel comfortable in that. Uh, and also, I mean, I also enjoyed you know, the audience's response, but I, but I learned to love the, the actual rehearsal process more than anything, but what was it that you loved about acting? Um, you know, I, I was, I would go see a movie and I'd see a moment or, you know, a scene would stick out in my head and I would actually go home and sit about an inch from a mirror and try to get the sound of the intimacy that that person was doing. And, and I would try to do that. And I think it was that rehearsal process of like, find the real in this, mm -hmm. find, find the honest voice, the honest place. And, and this started before a lot of training that I took, you know, that mm -hmm. was, that was kind of the, the thing where I, I thought I started analyzing it. In the sense of of uh, and and this sounds like get out of your you know I'm too deep in my head but it was more a matter of like wh what is it that makes it sound and what is it that makes it real and what is it that that I'm connecting to why did I connect to it and that was just something that was like a little quirk of mine that I was doing when I was younger mm -hmm. um, but I I think I think in just as you know at first it was all comedy and kind of like you know, big plays and musicals and things like that. And what I liked about that was, you know, just having fun at that. Yeah. And, yeah. you know, I'm saying something, I think it's funny. They're responding, they're laughing. That's just mm. so much fun in that. Right. Um, but the drama was, uh, I feel like it's, that's the love I feel is, is the, who is this person? And it was less of an escape for me. I wasn't trying to escape myself. Right. Um, I see, I see that happening with a lot of people. And, and I, I personally wasn't at the time. Mm -hmm. um, I feel like sometimes I, I, when I was taking class at Luz a few years ago, I was like, oh, this would be nice. Yeah. Or, you know, let's, let's, uh, let's explore what this is. Or, oh, this person's life is a lot more interesting than mine. You know, <laughs> you know <laughs> like that. Um, but, but for the most part, it was, um, it was finding the real. And then, uh, and then when you, when you find a good partner to act off of uh, just kind of that magic, that tennis match that you play with, with somebody else. Um, I think that's it. I, it's a, such a weird question. Like, what do you love about acting so much? I, I, I think that's the emotion. And, you know, I obviously went through so much of it as a kid and had that, I guess, readily available for the drama stuff, but that, 
I barely tapped into that stuff early on. I think it was, it was just more a matter of, okay, I've seen this, I've experienced this. And, um, and one of my favorite things too, is like finding the truth of somebody that I have no idea what right. their life was like, or, or didn't think about before, before opening this play or the script. So um, I, that's, you know, the three dimension, the four dimension of, of a human being. And what, right. what is that person's truth? What's that, their honesty? And um, yeah, it's that process, man. It's that rehearsal. It's that, it's that character kind of development where I probably wasn't as good at it, at it when I was younger, definitely got better at it you know, just in terms of breaking down somebody and what does that mean? But eventually, again, you have to strip that away and play. And um, I think the playing is like what draws me the most. Uh, it's, the, it's the most fun. People are, you know, pe people are expressing themselves and, um, and trying to communicate ideas to other people through scenarios, I think is a beautiful thing. And, um, you know, instead of scolding or teaching or, you know, telling somebody, somebody, you know, their opinion, they're, they're doing it through some, some form of experience that we're watching. Um, and now I, you know, I just did uh, the diary of Anne Frank uh, a few years ago with um, Stan Zimmerman, who is one of the writers from Gilmore Girls. Okay. And he did this, uh, he did a version of the production where uh, he turned all of the Jewish characters into uh, Latinx characters. Okay. And it was, it was, it was basically a, a play off of what was going on in the border. Right. And, um, and so it was, it was super powerful. And I actually played um, the, the man that hosted them, you know, in the house. Okay. So I was the one, even though I was Latino, I was actually playing one of the white characters, still one of the, the Germans who wasn't, you know, under the persecution. So mm -hmm. um but what was cool about that was that was the first play that I had done after all, this whole wave of social and people in their phones and people yelling at each other on the internet and, um, and all of that and a disconnect from, from art, you know, for the most part from like, you know, sitting down in a play and paying attention for two hours without squirming and looking in your phone. And, um, and what was amazing was, you know, we were doing this for a lot of schools and I realized uh, theater, I realized only then, Brian, only then did I realize that theater is more powerful than, than a film or, or television because uh, this is gonna get a little new agey, but like vibration, you know, you feel somebody's energy when they come into right. a room. And if, if, you know, if, if a father is crying because, you know, he lost his whole family to the Holocaust, and he's got this booming emotional moment that is rooted in, you know, in his complete truth, whatever that is, you can't get out of that room. You, you can't, you can't turn it off. You can't escape it. It's there. It's happening in front of you. And there's the only thing to do is to get sucked in and empathize for the person. Yeah. You know, you, you are locked in the whole, the, the, the space is black except for that pool of light that he's in. And, um, and that's, there is something visceral and something that is that only happens when you're in the space when somebody is having an emotional moment. So, um, yeah. So that was, uh, you know, I, you know, that's been a that was a, a cool moment that just happened recently. But now, where was that? Uh, he did it in a few places. We did it at uh, the complex, and mm -hmm. uh, he also did it at the um, I'm forgetting the name of the temple, the one that's in Beverly Hills, off of. Um, off of oh my god burton way um okay. and uh and they've actually tore that that uh synagogue down and and um and i think he did he had done it once before uh at the complex with with one run before and then we actually went to canada and did it up there um which was great um so we did that once uh about a year ago and um it's been a good response but um, why did you start acting, Brian? You started it to escape? Well, I mean, uh, it, you know, it's funny and it does tie in to, uh, something that we have in common, but, um, well, what happened was, is, uh, I, I, I shouldn't say in common, something that we have a, um, a connection through. Um, but, um, 
so I, I, you know, I didn't, my relationship with my father was odd. He, uh, I, he, you know, he's very distant. Um, you know, he's, he's, he's a comedian or was a comedian. He was, you know, he was friends with Lenny Bruce. So he was like, a, he was oh, like a pro professional comedian yeah. during, during that era. And, uh, you know, he's, you know, like a, a lot of comedians, you know, he's got his, uh, I guess, uh, dark passenger. <laughs> and, oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. and so, you know, it was def very difficult to connect with him. And so what I wanted to do so bad was to find a way to connect with him. So on the weekends, my, he would drive me from my grandmother's to, uh, my mother's home, um, because I just go visit my grandmother on the weekends. But, um, when I go back, I remember listening to Saturday with Sinatra <laughs> and, uh, it was something about that music that kind of, I don't know, it, it moved me in some way, but it also, you know, made me want to connect with him because it was, I knew it was something he liked. And, uh, so I started singing and then through singing, I got in the choir and then through choir, I, I found out they were doing guys and dolls, a musical and, uh, Frank Sinatra was in the movie guys and dolls. And so I was like, I want to, I want to be the Frank Sinatra character. You, yeah. uh, which is which is Nathan Detroit. And so I tried out, I didn't get the Frank Sinatra role, but I got a, another uh, role that had a solo. It wasn't the most popular song. I think they usually cut it from the, <laughs> they cut it from the movie, but anyway, it's in the, it's in the actual musical, the play. Yeah. And, um, and so I did that and that's where it all started. I started like, um, you know, performing through that. And then I, I, I got into musicals and plays, but it was ultimately the, a way to try to connect with my father and to, to get his attention oh, yeah. and approval. And, um, but then, you know, I, uh, through the process, I, you know, I, I remember seeing how it affected people. Like people would come up to me after a show and I remember seeing their faces and their expressions. And I, it, you know, it meant a lot to me that they appreciated it. And then uh, through that, specifically really and i think you can understand is working with craig belknap and lou palter mm. that's where i fell in love with it i really fell in love with the process of discovery finding the character the truth as you mentioned um i loved that discovery process it was just it was beautiful exciting uh, it, was, it was stimulating it was everything and i actually enjoyed that more than the actual show itself yeah. i just loved the discovery yeah. and so that's that's initially how i got into it got it yeah i never knew that i didn't know that you sang first i didn't i, I didn't know that about you yeah i mean i i i didn't really do it for i mean i did it in choir a little bit and i did it here and there but i, I didn't you know do it professionally or anything like that but it it was just the way that i found performing and yeah. and was trying to get my father's attention and um and so yeah that was it and auditioning for CalArts came up. Why? How did that work with you? Well, I, I mean, I knew I wanted to, and it's funny, I've been thinking about this a lot lately because, you know, I, I've been going through this whole kind of thing where I've been like, fuck, what, what have I done with my life? Or like, I have an enormous amount of regret. And, and a lot of it is centered around how I've dealt with my, um, my vision loss. Uh -huh. And so I, I've been thinking about this a lot and I'm like, I remember at 18 years old going, I do not want like a nine to five job ever. I do not ever mm -hmm. want to have, I don't understand why people have those jobs. Yeah. Yeah. And I was like, why, I, why, why would you do that if you didn't have to? And I'm like, I don't want to ever do that. And so I got into that and I, I only went to CalArts just, I think I just wanted to continue acting and I didn't really think about it. I only applied to two places. I applied to CalArts and Juilliard. I didn't get into Juilliard. I got, I got into a second audition, but I didn't make it to the final. And, um, and then I got into Cal arts and I really liked, you know, how engaged they were and asking questions. And, and it was, it was Roger Henderson. No, who was the other one? Roger. It might've been Roger. Was it Roger or Ferdinand or. I think it was, was might've been Ferdinand. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. I think it was Ferdinand. And, uh, I just, um, I, yeah, I just appreciated his questions and I, and, and then I just, and you know, I, I got in and I, I went and I just went yeah. for it. And I, I think, and I, I went after Cal arts, I went to UCLA and got a master's degree in directing, but that was a whole other thing. But the, um, going there was just wonderful. I mean, I, I, you probably remember, it felt like a fucking family. It really felt like, absolutely. 
like we were all we, we I mean, we were all trauma bonded, really, because yeah. we all had to like share yeah. each other's trauma and like yeah. live in it. And uh, and speaking of trauma, we lost, you know, um, you know, uh, Robert Thomas. And like, mm-hmm. you know, I think about him all the time because I had to, he and I, I, I don't know if you remember, but in Claudia's class, we had to do those, um, uh, you know, uh, character studies where we studied each other's speech patterns and Robert was, we were partners. So we spent a lot of time together talking about, you know, experiences. And so, yeah, it's just, um, it was like a family and I, and I felt that I've always felt that way. And, and, you know, I don't see everybody, um, that often, but, um, you know, Matt Dittman, is is uh is still one of my closest friends in the world and um you know um it's it it just feels like that I, and i and i haven't had that in, in any other place yeah, I and mean, ucla was totally different like not yeah. the same experience you know? yeah uh, cal arts is cal arts is special i feel like i've been lucky enough to have that family moment happen and a few times um because of my drama teacher in high school was such a driving force that she was like a second mother to so many people and and just because she was helping out so many kids that you know their parents weren't around and you know they were living in poverty and weren't didn't have enough money to get to you know some of our speech tournaments and we would do these you know fundraisers and all of that like we were all we all did it for everybody you know and um and everybody was incredibly talented there it happened there. And then it happened back to back at Cal arts where I thought, Oh, this is how, is this how life goes? Is this how I experience it? Cause I, I, no, after Cal arts, it wasn't, it wasn't around for a while. And yeah. um, luckily I worked at another, at a company. I did work at a nine to five at a company and everybody there was amazing. And there's been few moments where it's like, okay, cherish these moments. Cause this is, I mean, Cal arts was, it's like you said, we don't see everybody all the time. Um, yeah. Brian, you don't really see anybody. I don't. And, and I appreciate you mentioning that. Yeah. yeah I don't I, see anybody yeah, anymore. That's, that's really and awesome. I, I think about it, like I can still see your face and I remember your expressions and your eyes and yeah, yeah it's, uh, I, but you're still here. So. Yes. Oh yeah. yeah. I'm, I mean, we're still here. Um, but like it's, you know, we don't see everybody all the time, but when I do, it never, it, it's, it doesn't skip a beat. It's, con, it's a continuation of what we always had with each other. And that was just like pure love and looking out for each other. And, um, and I feel like there was a lot of support um, at times. And, you know, there's some, there were some weird moments, but not many, not many at all. And uh, yeah, I, I would say that too. There weren't that many either. Yeah. Um, you know, to tie back in what I was talking about with Sinatra, I want to mention that I wrote a play Oof. called Alone with Sinatra and you played Frank Sinatra. Man, that was such a great time. Can we just yeah. relish in how much fun we had during that, that yeah. rehearsal process? And Katie, Kate was our director, right? Yeah. Are you in contact with her, Katie Ackerman? She and I, I feel like we're on social somewhere. She got married, might've changed her last name. So it might've cha- maybe Buchanan, I think is okay. something okay. like that, but I'll, I'll find her contact for you after we're done. Um, right. I think she's still in my friend list somewhere. Right. Um, right. Yeah. And Derek Magyar, right. That was, that was actually the first time I met that guy. Um, yeah. And uh, who else was in it? I'm trying to remember the other actors that were in it. I'm blanking. Teddy was in it. He had, Teddy Matthews had a, a small part in it. Um, and uh, yeah, I'm kind of blanking too because yeah. I haven't thought about it in so many years. So but long. Yeah, I mean, there were. Uh, uh, but what a yeah. play, man. What a play. I always tell everybody whenever I talk about you, I tell them about that play and I give them a little log line. And everybody loves the log line, man. Like everybody loves the premise of the play. You know, it's a right. writer who gets writer's block. He drinks. And in his drunken episodes, Frank Sinatra comes and speaks to him. And it's such a cool, fun, you know, exploration of somebody who's, you know, trying to discover it and, and figure himself out. Yeah, it's it's funny. I mean, I, I'll tell you two things. One thing I did not know this, but a friend of mine who came and saw it, 
And I had no idea of this at the time. And, mm. but, um, the, it, it, it's, it's very similar. Like the, the, not the plot, like the, the story's diff, totally different, but the, the idea is, is similar, but Woody Allen wrote, uh, a, uh, he wrote a film called play it again, Sam. Of course. And it's a similar premise, but instead of Frank Sinatra of talking with, you know, Woody Allen, it was, uh, or not Woody or me. Yeah. <laughs> but, <laughs> but it was, uh, Frank Sinatra, uh, excuse me, uh, Woody Allen having a conversation with Humphrey Bogart. Right. Or, or like one of his characters, like Sam Spade or something like that. Yeah. 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 And, uh, but yeah, man, that was that was so much fun. Such a great time. And, and you was, were awesome in that, man. You really captured Frank. That was that was uh, I, oh, I'm, man, I'm so I happy that you were able to play it. Oh, man, I appreciate that. I, I, I was so like, oh, man, this is such an icon. And like, I don't know what to do with this. So all, the, the thing that I did the most was just study his speech as much as, much as possible. And, yeah. And try to get that. Uh, try to get that. Sorry, my my socials popping. And that's all right. That's um, all right. But just trying to get that uh, that cadence in his voice and in the, in the song and, and in talking, and um, kind of just started from there. I think that's where everything was leading from. Um, but man, I I loved it. I loved it so much. Did um, I ever tell you what the like the premise of that how that came about? No, please, maybe, maybe. You well, I, I don't know if I talked about it because I was still kind of dealing with it. But what happened was my second year. After we we did Mara Saad, right? Yeah. And was I was going through some like serious mental health crisis stuff. Like I, so we uh, it was right after Mara Saad, and so which which is fitting, I guess, because it's about yeah. a, you know uh, an asylum. Yeah. And um, that was your class, by the way. You guys were crazy. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And so I I don't know what happened, but I I just having like these weird like incident i they, they said it was depression but what happened was is um i don't know i started thinking my cat was like thinking like it wanted to kill me and like uh -huh. and i started waking up like pacing around like an animal and i it was having this weird so weird stuff and so uh, I, I one of the psychologists i was telling the site the, the school psychologist the cal arts about what was going on she's like you need to go and and check yourself in and find out what's going on here so yeah. I, she helped, um, self-admit me to the, the Mayo. What is that place in Valencia? It's like Henry Mayo. Yeah. Henry Mayo. And, uh, and so I checked in there and I was in there for two days, I think about somewhere, something like that. And I, it was just huh. miserable. Like I had, I had like take off my shoelaces and I had, I had no belt and like, oh my God. and like the phone cords were like only like a half an inch long. Cause I didn't want anybody like hanging themselves with the phone cord and like oh my gosh yeah it was weird and uh so that's what that 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 uh how that came about was that experience me being in a, a mental hospital for a couple of days and uh going through that it turned out that it i was diagnosed in there as schizophrenic uh -huh. and um and then I, I was like fuck i was really scared because my uncle was diagnosed as schizophrenic and he killed himself. Got and it. so I was like, fuck, I'm, I'm just going to repeat the family cycle again. You right. know what I mean? And so I was very scared. And then I ended up going to, to a psychologist afterwards and they said, no, you're not schizophrenic. You just have depression with psychotic symptoms. And so that's how alone with Sinatra was created. Unbelievable. So, yeah. so did it help? Did any of it help? It really did. It was, it was pretty therapeutic and, uh, you know, it was cathartic as well. Um, and I, and I, I enjoyed it. You know, I, I wish I had known the premise of play it again, Sam, before I wrote it, but. <laughs> well, but look, know. I mean, you, you did something that was, I, I think that's like a universal emotion. You didn't know that. So, yeah. But also, but also you know, uh, the thing about that, what I'm curious about is the writing part, because I, I had written something later on with a writing partner. Um, I always need to write with somebody else. I feel like, um, I don't know why I haven't sat down and disciplined myself enough to, to do it myself. Um, I feel like I need to bounce ideas off of, but we did the script and when people started doing it, it was the most amazing, fulfilling feeling 
that I didn't know I was missing. And uh, like, it was, you know, oh my gosh, they're reading my words and they're actually putting more life than I was imagining. Um, yeah. And I'm wondering about, you know, how many plays did you write before Sinatra that you got to see people do and, and whatnot? Was that something that you did before Cal Arts? No, no, that was the first play I had, I had ever written. Um, yeah, amazing. And um, it, it's, it, I don't, it, it, it just kind of came out. And, yeah. uh, and I think it was just because I was so fucking scared. I was so, I didn't know where I was going to go because I, I'm, I'm, I, what happened was, is I found out the first year and I apologize to everybody who's listening and watching, but I know I'm, I've explained this many times, but um, what happened was my first year at CalArts, I told my mother I was going to go to the optometrist in Granary Square. You know, <laughs> there was yeah. one over there oh, yeah. and it had leave it to Beaver. That's his picture was in there because I would think that was his optometrist, but Jerry Mathers. But anyway, so I went there to get um, my eyes checked and the uh, optometrist said, you have something seriously wrong with your eyes. And I told my mother about it. And then she told me, you know, uh, well, we'll deal with it when you get home. And when I came home, she and my brother told me that I had Usher syndrome, which causes blindness and deafness. And so I had that, that was the end of my first year. And How so long I did they know, well, that was the thing. I didn't mention it just to kind of abbreviate things, but my mother, when I told her that I was going to that optometrist, she had called him and said, don't tell him that what's wrong with his eyes because he doesn't know. And he's like, I can't do that you know, right. He's a grown person. Yeah. And so he said, I, I won't tell him what it is, but, um, you know, you got to tell him. And so yeah. he told me you have to see an, uh, ophthalmologist. And, and that's when I went home. And then they told me that I had Usher syndrome. And so I think my point in saying that is, I think I was just so fucking scared. Yeah. And th with that, and then the idea of, losing my mind on top of it. And I still have that fear today. I mean, I'm like, I'm going to fucking lose my mind on top of, you know, losing yeah. everything else. Yeah. So it was, it was, it was that. And, uh, that's, that's how it came out was just, interesting. you know, Sarah Louise talks about that, you know, her, the reason she does acting and art and everything is that it's a, it's a form of survival. And I, I think that's what it was for me as well. Yeah, absolutely, man. I, I mean, I didn't, I didn't know. I didn't know that was happening. Obviously you didn't tell everybody. Um, but yeah, it was weird. I, and I, and I really feel shitty about it because I, I, I sometimes did like Edward the second. I remember telling the whole, the cast about it because I ran into like one of the, the uh, modular theater, like pistons that, yeah. you know, for the, and, um, and I had to tell everybody, but I, then I went back into denial for Richard Foreman when I got into that and I dropped out of that because I was worried about not being able to function in it. Yeah. Brian, and you were in, you were in some epic plays. I mean, all, those three plays that he just mentioned, everybody were epic shows at school. You were in some of the coolest ones. Oh, uh, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. I, I, it, it, it was, uh, yeah, I was very fortunate. Um, with the and and you as well, man. I I I always admired your work, and I and I was so I was so fucking happy that you were able to play Frank Sinatra because mm -hmm. I I I I you were the only choice. Oh man. Yeah. Come on. No, I'm serious, man. Like you, you, you. you the, I wish, I wish. I don't know if it's recorded. I think Katie maybe recorded it, but I I wish I could go back and look at it just to see it. Today. Oh my God, that would be amazing. Yeah. Gosh, any, any video footage from that time period would, would be amazing to watch. Yeah. Yeah. It was, it was a, a wonderful experience and I'm glad that, that you were a part of it. And then we'll talk a little bit later, but I want uh, about another project that <laughs> you were involved in, but um, so what happened after CalArts or what, let me, let, before we leave CalArts, what was the yeah. thing that you took away, the greatest gift that you received from CalArts? Oof, like a single one? Oh man. It doesn't, it does not be one. Um, you know, I, I, I think when CalArts was done, I, I knew I was ready. You know, it, it definitely made us as scary as, the prospects of getting out into the world and trying to be the actor and all that stuff. Um, 
that was still scary and still looming and and you know the unknown was always there but um but i was ready and i think that was the best feeling was i knew i could go to an audition and not be the most unprepared one there you know yeah. I, I knew i had something you know if i wasn't the best one i was going to be one of the best ones and not in a sense of like a competitive way just more and, and even though i couldn't shake that after high school um, yeah it was never about like competing and like, uh, you know, like, you know, the, the dark ego parts of, of competition. It was more a matter of like doing my best. And I feel like when I am, when I know I'm in my zone and I, I've got it, I'm, I'm going to do something. Yeah. And, um, and I think that was kind of the, the best takeaway. Cause you know, I can be shy and insecure a lot of time. I mean, most of the time. Um, but with rehearsal and preparation uh, with a part, if I got the chance to get some preparation for something, it was, it was always something that I knew I could, I could nail. Mm -hmm. um, I think there was that also just. And you, 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 you uh, were a very good cold reader, if I remember correctly. Uh, that's, it's kind of been one of the things that I love the most. Yeah. It was right. cold reading. Um, it was like kind of just getting, finding some emotion in it without, you know, stumbling on it. Right. Um, but also like, you know, the other side of it too was all the talent that I was surrounded by was, uh, it just made us better. Yeah. And, you know, I looked up to so many people, uh, people, you know, in years above and below me. And mm -hmm. um, I, I was truly a fan of so many friends of ours. Yeah. And, um, and I found out later on that, like, maybe that wasn't always reciprocated from different people. That's, a, that's really a how so. Stories. Yeah, no, I, I would hear like, you know, stories later on, like, well, they weren't always a big fan. I was like, interesting. <laughs> <laughs> OK, <laughs> well, I, I thought they were good. You know, I could I could shake that off and think that they were good. So maybe um, it was a competitive jealousy type thing might have been a little bit of that which was yeah. stupid because i was like in in awe of them so i was like what okay whatever um, what it may have been is as you were so calm you were so light and you had a confidence whether if it was a poker face or not right. i think it uh, that was the, that was the one thing is i always felt like you always felt comfortable wherever you were yes i yes i think that's just kind of a a theme of me for sure mm -hmm. that like you know i think that's like kind of helps the producing now um you know as when i produce some projects and sometimes they go haywire and there's lots of moving pieces and parts and it it could be stressful and scary and for me it's not you know it's just you know the the ship sinking and you know the the traveling circus must go on and there's always going to be a solution somewhere there um and I feel like that's kind of the same, <laughs> the same guy that you're talking about. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I think that was the other thing was just everybody, everybody around me and, and so much insane talent that I knew, well, if I'm going here and I'm, you know, getting the small successes that I find here at the school uh, with, you know, next to, you know, next to these people, then, you know, holy shit, you know, this is going to be okay um at least for you know for a little bit we could try it and um yeah so many good people at that school brian so many good people yeah i mean uh aaron shiver went on to do boardwalk empire right and um, uh he, cortez he made that film yeah yeah um i mean so many and i mean hugo obviously hugo was um i feel like did you guys overlap with hugo ever you did one year yeah right? well you know it was funny the my first year um uh, is it carrots for hair mm -hmm. is that the play oh yeah that's the play. yeah i was uh on crew for that and which one which which one because he did it twice i what? think it was the first time it so wasn't it the like, time with waleed got it it was no 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 waleed it was, was, the, was the film but i it, think they did it they did it twice as a play one kind of workshopped pared down less production and this was in the modular theater. It was my yeah. first year in 1997. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I know which one that was. I and I remember I, I was like so pissed because like that the clothes could get so dirty in that in that show. Yeah. And my 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 duty was to to wash them. Oh my god. And I was 
and I was up to like, I don't know, one or two in the morning doing that. I was just like, Jesus. Fuck. That's right. That's right. Oh, yeah. So I know which one you're in. You were in the main production with all the mud and everything. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I played a dead body in that one. And um, they, I remember just Hugo falling on my body once. And I was like, oh. oh, oh. <laughs> what is he, like six, five? Yeah, he's a giant. He's, a, yeah. he's like seven feet. He's a giant. He's a giant Viking of a person with right with, with the same size of talent. Um, so, you know, it was him and, and Amber and Mandy in their class and Saida and there was, their class was incredible. Um, and then there was uh, just so many people in every class, ev everywhere that you look, there was somebody that was like, wow, they're going to be somebody special. Um, or, you know, Mark Marin was, I don't know what episode, but he was like talking about like, he's like, yeah, there's a lot of people that went to Cal arts. Right? Huh. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's it's starting to, you know, bubble up even more. What's funny is, Brian, I don't think you know this. Um, maybe you do. I'm not sure. But they did their first center of new work play that they did at the Red Cat Theater was uh, this Chinese opera called um, Peach Blossom Fan. Okay. And they had apparently were they were like kind of like Richard Foreman. They were workshopping it. There was this um, this big. Uh, Chinese director um, from the Peking Opera who was okay. doing it and um, very avant-garde, very, very new Cal arts. And, um, and uh, they had, uh, they were doing that, they workshopped it. And I guess what the next semester when they decided to put it on, they started casting, uh, they, they, they wanted to cast actors that had gone to school there, guest artists, um, and then the teachers and, and some students kind of like Lear mm -hmm. and, um, and they brought me back. I auditioned for, it was the, the, the love interest of the lead girl. And I had okay. a few songs in it, a few scenes in it. Um, and then I would go off stage, but it was mostly a chorus piece with a, with a chorus of concubines and two of okay. the actresses that were in that chorus that I became friends with then was Cecily Strong and Alison Brie. And they're, oh, really? they're in the course. They're actually still on the website for the play that the photos are still up there, you know, the, the, the PR photos. And it's funny to see, I was like, oh my God, those two are, those two are giant now. Yeah. Um, and uh, yeah, CalArts, CalArts had, had some people there. It was a, it was a great, great time. But um, yeah. So what year was that? That was, I think, 2004 or three. Okay something like that. I think it was like three or four. And I had, I had done some things at that point, but nothing giant. Um, I did book some pilots, I feel like. And it was, I think it was, it was a little funny because when we graduated CalArts, I started right away. I started hmm. doing some things right away. Um, and then everybody else started trickling in slowly. I think it was just because I looked so damn young the whole time. Mm -hmm. uh, I was getting all those like young auditions for mm -hmm. that was the that was the WB era of right. all those like teen shows and 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 that shit. I mean, mm -hmm. sorry, wonderful wonderful projects. I ended, up, <laughs> I ended up on one later. Um, but uh, <laughs> uh, but yeah, so it was a lot of that. And and man, I got I got a lot of experience from auditioning during those times. But um, that was, yeah, that was it. Uh, that was pretty much kind of the, the main takeaway was I'm ready for this. And I loved, I loved everybody there. And I know that like I was in good company coming out of there. Um, and that was it. And then I, and then we, I just started auditioning. I did, I had a really killer showcase that got me some people immediately. And showcase was definitely a funny thing everybody approached showcase a little differently. And I feel like it was uh, very dependent on what piece they ended up with mm -hmm. and, and the amount of confidence they felt in themselves or what it would do for them, you know, past that. And, um, but mine was, uh, actually mine was not drama free. Uh, I ended up doing some piece with Megan Henning. Okay. Uh, it was a Shanling piece. I think it was like, I forget what it's called. You might know it. It's where they were like, like two 12 year olds basically having a kiss for the first time but okay. we're but we're 18 or sorry 22 doing it and you know we looked 18 right. um, but 
but you know, we're, we're 22 year olds doing it for a graduation. And this is a good story. Don Cheadle came to our showcase class that one day. Oh, right. Yeah. And he, they all saw the scenes with Susan and Fran, our two deans. And, um, they saw that, that scene. And I think it was Fran and Susan, but I think it was mostly Fran that said that they didn't want us to do that scene. And this was two weeks before showcase. You know, they tell us two weeks. We have the, what entire, the, fuck? the entire fucking year to do it. <laughs> so now, you know, and you know how close we got at the end of, you know, those four years, like now Fran and Susan are like part of my family. And if I'm going to get pissed off, I, I'm going to get pissed off, you know, and right. I did. And I stormed out and I, that was like, at that, at, that actually was my dramatic moment that you missed, Brian. Um, and I, I stormed out of class and I was like, what the fuck? I, Cause it was, it was a perfect scene. Yeah. And Don Cheadle walked me off the ledge, man. He talked, he, did? he talked me down. He came out wow. and he said, look, it was something along the lines of, I, I don't remember exactly what he said, but it was something along the lines of like, Look, I don't know you. <laughs> right. I don't know anything. I think they sent him uh, to go talk to me. That and is awesome. It was. It's pretty, pretty fucking cool. Yeah. And, and he said, um, "Look, uh, I don't know you. All of this, but they basically said that they want you to do something by yourself, and that you know they don't want you to to play something younger." Okay. Like, and. And then finally I calmed down and the thought was you've been playing these young kind of roles all through school and you should be by yourself. You're going to do a monologue and be strong by yourself. And I thought, I was like, what the fuck does that mean? And I, I <laughs> then I started getting in my fucking head and then a panicking cause it's two weeks away. And uh, one of my coaches from high school uh, did some, they, my high school coaches were amazing. Let me turn that shit off. Uh, they said, uh, they were like, uh, they had made a book of monologues for Mike Benson, a, a mutual friend of ours. And, um, they, this book was for Mike to have forever. If you need any monologue that you, that they saw him doing, he literally Xeroxed plays and hole punched them and put them in this binder and he had these monologues. And in there, I found this monologue. Um, I always forget the name of it now that I'm getting older because it's been so long. I um, mean, it wasn't, it wasn't a very popular play. Um, I think it, Fragments, I think is what it's called. John J. Garrett, Fragment. Mm -hmm. And it was about like uh, a, a, a kid who's going to talk to his dad's name at the Vietnam Wall. And I just read that premise and I, I read the monologue once and my tears were hitting the page as I read it. I was like, oh, okay, cool. I don't have to act. <laughs> there it is. I'm already affected. I could do this. Like I could do this with my eyes closed because it's all written there. So um, I, I lucked out and that was, at that moment I was like, okay, this is what I'm going to do. And then I did it and everyone thought like, yep, that's your, that's your monologue. So um, it was cool. And they, they put me up last, which was very nice because I made everybody cry apparently. And Oh, wow. It was like a nice like moment, like where everyone was like, okay, this is great. So I feel like that definitely helped me out a lot and positioned things a lot for me. And, and uh, yeah, so I got, I got, um, I got signed by Shia LaBeouf's manager, uh, okay. this, this guy named uh, John Crosby. Okay. And, and Deborah Shaw was his assistant and this wonderful British woman. Mm -hmm. And um, she kind of was the one who, who spotted me out. Now, is it Matt? I feel like Matt Dittman had something to do with her, didn't Matt? A hundred percent. You're totally reminding me. Yes. Yeah, because she was also because we were both she was encouraging him and I was encouraging him to do stand up comedy. Yes. Yeah. Yes. I'm remembering now um, yeah. completely like I forgot that there was that connection there, but. I think Matt was also happening too and, and all that because he's just so damn funny. Yeah. And, um, and I might have said something where I was like, you got to look out for that guy. That guy is going to be like a comedian. That's, that guy can't turn it off. Yeah. Like, I, I was just watching it again because I saw it when you posted it a, a few weeks ago, but I wanted to watch it again now to remember like, what is the flow of the show? And, uh, <laughs> and, and I, Matt Dittman, everybody, cannot turn off his comedy. Like he I know. 
stop. It's it, that's when you know, like it's he's made for it. But yeah, it, 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 when I'm with him, I'm in my happy place. Mm-hmm. Yeah, for sure. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and as far as the flow, I think that that depends on how much weed I've had. For the, <laughs> Yeah. and how stressful my work day was and yeah. that determines it so <laughs> but um yeah i think i took a little too much before this but that's all right we're, that's we're working fine. through it we're getting through it man we're getting through <laughs> it. i'm jealous i need to catch up with you you know I'll, yeah i'll get on that in a few okay so uh so you you uh started working you did that play at the red cat what what happened after that um well the first thing i don't know if you remember was my two lines with Al Pacino. Do you remember that? I do. I do remember yeah, that. It was, it was in, that, in, was it in, it wasn't, it was, no. No, no, no. It was in a terrible movie. It was called Simone. It was that one where he plays the producer who gets the hard drive. The yeah. Gets the hard drive of the digital actress. And right. Everyone thinks she's real. And then he becomes famous again and everybody's kissing his ass. And I played this parking ballet. That, right. Yes. I remember. Yeah. 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 So that so was how was that working with him? Uh, fucking nerve wracking. What like that was straight out of school, Brian. I didn't know what the <laughs> fuck. That was the first time I was on thirty five millimeter right. film on a big on an actual camera on an actual set. It was the the director of Gattaca. Right. Uh, so you know that alone made my brain melt, and um, I I had auditioned for Jason Schwartzman's part. Okay. Uh, and nothing happened. And then a few months go by and they're like, you got, you got the part of this parking ballet in the movie. I was like, mm. what? <laughs> okay. <laughs> what does it entail? And then, you know, as you find out that it's Al Pacino that you're going to be talking against and all that stuff, it's just like a lot of nerves, a lot of nerves yeah. at that point. And then, um, but yeah, it was, it was, it was pretty wonderful and frightening at the same time. There's so many funny stories out of that where it's like, uh, um, you know that he shows up an hour later his call was an hour after mine i'm like what, what's that about you know like we're in the same scene um right. and, and then uh during rehearsal basically the scene is he's handing me his parking ticket is you know his his ticket for his car and i rip the stub off and i hand it back to him and i say the line mm-hmm. and we're doing the rehearsal on the way to rehearsal they say Let's get Alan Allen on the set. And that's when my heart started <laughs> going. And then we get into rehearsal and Brian, I had two lines. My line was, it'll be just a minute, Mr. Transky. We're giving you a complimentary car wash. Oh, okay. Oh yeah. Yeah. We're cleaning the engine now. That was the line. Right. And we're walk. we, we get to rehearsal and that line turned into, is it black? And I couldn't talk in the rehearsal. I could not get the three lines out. Now, was Al there or did they have a stand-in? He was there for the rehearsal. Okay. Now, I think just because they're pros and they've done it a gazillion times, nobody gave a shit. Right. They were doing it for marking and lighting and everything. So I was like, okay, cool. They're fine with it. They ignored it. They figured I'm going to figure it out by the time we're rolling, which mm-hmm. I did, which mm-hmm. I did. But, but we're doing the rehearsal and I'm realizing like Al didn't. Oh, sorry. We go to hair and makeup. We come back. Then we're now like doing it and we try to do one take and I, they didn't give any notes. And then they're like adjusting stuff at the camera and video village is about like mm-hmm. 40, 50 feet away. And, um, and we're just kind of standing there in this big open parking lot. It's just him and I, and he's not handing me the ticket, Brian. And nobody's telling him that he needs to hand the ticket to me for this to make sense. And And what was he doing that time? I think just saying the line or just kind of doing it. It it was weird. Okay. And it wasn't working. It wasn't working. But nobody is telling him anything. And at one point they had said, hey, this is what we're going to do. But if Al wants to do something else, we're going to, you know, we're going to roll with that. So, you know, just be <laughs> so, you know, they had told me that going, you know, getting there. Right. So um, so then like I'm standing there 
And I'm, you know, now my brain's thinking, Brian. Now fucking, mm. I start to fucking think. And right. I'm like, nobody's talking to him. And I'm hyper aware of direction and when and communication between two people. And mm. when something is not being communicated or somebody's voice drops and that other person didn't hear that word, I pick up on that. Yeah. And so I'm like thinking like, they're never going to tell this guy what to fucking do. Yeah. Am I going to be the guy that gets fired on my first job? Because I'm telling, <laughs> I'm telling Al Pacino what to fucking do. Right. I'm like, dude, all right, here we go. So as subtle and gently as possible, I kind of, hey, so, you know, um, during the line they were telling me before, I kind of put it on them. You know, you got to, you have to hand me the ticket and then, you know, whatever. So now Video Village sees that the, the young pup day player is talking to fucking Al Pacino. So they rush over and they're right. like, oh, what's going on? What's going on? Hey, oh, oh, oh yeah. And, um, and Al Pacino looks at Andrew Nichol and he says, I've never done this. <laughs> and all, the AD, Andrew Nichol and I look at each other like, what in the royal fuck? Right. And he says it again. I, I, I've never done this before. <laughs> and all I thought of was, holy shit, this guy got famous on Godfather and Serpico and his plays in New York and moved to Los Angeles and had a limo driver because those were limo driver days. Yeah. And never fucking drove his car or parked it at a valet or handed a ticket to. He always had a driver, always yeah. had somebody, Mr. Pacino. That was that was Al Pacino's life. Yeah. And it immediately it was like, oh my God, this man has never driven in his life and done the most simplest thing that we've all done in our lives. Yeah. And and then Andrew Nichols like, well, well, okay, well, you know, just kind of accepting it and okay, well, what you got to do is rip the ticket and hand it to, him and he, you know, tells him the most basic direction, and then you know we were fine after that. But, right. Um, so that was funny, and then you know, then the nerves are gone. I did the scene. Um, and then he has like a longer scene with Jay Moore, like a few feet away. Um, and I, we were hanging out with Jay Moore, amazing guy, really, really nice guy, Jay Moore. Right. Uh, the comedian. Yeah. The An actor. Comedian. Yeah. So, so cool. And uh, <laughs> actually, that's a funny story. Too. And uh, <laughs> and then we I'm hanging out with this other day player and we start saying Pacino lines we're like, can you fucking believe it? We're fucking doing this. And of course, he does some Scarface. I right. start doing Glenn Gary. I'm like, you fucking child. <laughs> whoever, whoever told you you could work with men you fucking child i don't care <laughs> whose dick you're sucking whose cousin you are you're going down yeah and so i'm doing that and uh and he fucking walks by so i was like oh, okay oh, that was a good shit. run guys that was a good run everybody that was a good career great first job all right it's over and he looks over at me and he kind of looks back like over his shoulder as he's walking away and he looks back over his shoulder and gives me kind of like a, what is that little twinkle in his eye? <laughs> and I said, oh, you know, I'm just saying some lines from a movie called Glenn Gary, Glenn Ross. Right. I said that directly to him. And he's like, I thought I recognized that. <laughs> and then he walked away. I mean, he must get that all the time, though. You For know? sure. I mean, the end yeah. of the day when they wrapped me, I'm saying bye to everybody. And then I look over at him. And the way he was sitting in his chair was like the king and looking at this young, you know, knight <laughs> coming right. in his ring, like, what does this young pup want to say to me before he leaves? You know, like, yes, right. yes, yes. I, you know, it was the, it's been an honor, Mr. Bettina, or, you know, all the like, you know, all those gracious words, you know, like, oh my God, this was the best thing that ever happened. And yeah, you know, and you're incredible. I've always been a fan, blah, blah, blah. And, you know, and he's like, you know, like, of course, you know, it's like, he's used to it. You could see it in his eye, like, okay, this here comes, here comes the new guy who's, you know, worked with me for the first time and maybe is his first job. And, you know, so there's that. And uh, yeah, that was, that was it. So that's now let me ask you this. Was he like genuinely, how, what was his like expression when he says, I haven't done this before? Was it like embarrassment or was it like confusion? No, no it was actor discovery. Like okay. he, didn't, he didn't care. He was just more of like, I don't, I don't know what this is. What is this? Right. Like, okay. All right. I have to do this. All right. You know, it was more of like, I feel like it was more of that. It could have been confusion, but mm. it felt like it was just more of a, 
even though he wasn't the one asking the question, mm-hmm. that was his time to be like, what is this? You know, what, what is this moment? What's this beat? Right. Um, just kind yeah. of doing the moment to moment. And actually the best part about that whole moment was after we, after they told him what to do, him and I got to run the line and run that moment by ourselves with no camera near us mm-hmm. and the other extras near us. It was just us two. And I cherish that little few seconds for the rest of my life. Um, you, I, that's, that's amazing. That's a wonderful story. Yeah. Like, yeah. Yeah. That was crazy. That was a that was good times. I got a lot of curse. Uh, uh, people were cursing me a lot, uh, especially Drago at the time. He was right. just, you motherfucker, like your first fucking job. Like what? I was like, I, you know, in all honesty, it's all downhill from here, dude. So right. I peaked at the, the first one. So now what year was that? Was that like 2002? Uh, no, that was 2000. I, okay. Like, that was like maybe in, uh, maybe in June or July. When did we graduate? May? It was like, it was within two, three months of us graduating. Oh, wow. Okay. All right. Yeah. Because I remember hearing about that and being like, holy shit. (laughs) Yeah, that was that was immediately. And then I did uh, an episode of Buffy, uh, I think in like February after that. And the whole time I was thinking like, couldn't we have started with Sarah Michelle Gellar and then got to Al Pacino? Like, could we have just kind of eased me in a little better? But, uh, you know, that was uh, uh, but that was cool. A little short thing there. Um, a lot of short, small stuff is what I was doing for the most part. Right. Uh, well, quick things. So, right. Um, and yeah. then, and then, when did Gilmore Girls come along? Gilmore Girls came along much, much later, two thousand five. Okay. okay. So at that point, I was Amanda Tepe had gotten me a job at Partisan, which is Michelle Gondry's company. Okay. Um, and I was PAing for that company instead of waiting tables. And that's where the production side really started kind of start. That's where it started was, Mm -hmm. was that I knew I wanted to do production, but then being there, I was like, okay, now I got to see it and and do that. So I was doing that and auditioning at the same time. And I had booked a few pilots. So I had done at that point, I felt like I had booked two pilots and had tested for four pilots at that point. And when you test your, your rate goes up, which is incredible. Um, mm-hmm. you're, you're still kind of on a contract, whether you get hired or not. Um, so I think that, that was, I was, I was on a roll there for a bit. Right. And, um, the Gilmore girls happened. I think Deborah Shaw had set up a general meeting with that okay. with Jamie Rudofsky and Mara Casey. And, um, it was a generals. If, if nobody knows what that is, that's just a, like a sit down meeting. That's, right. not, that's not an audition for any part. It was just a, Hey, you know, my other clients, you trust me, you know, you should sit down with this guy and talk to him. Right. So we did that. And, um, I formed a really good bond with both of those ladies. I'm still in contact with them. I, I just actually hired Jamie as a casting director for a project that I worked on. Okay. Um, so uh, but at that time we were sitting down and it was just like this, we hit it off. We loved each other. And they're like, hey, you're going to, you're going to come in for everything. So they brought me in for everything for years, Brian. And I didn't book anything for years. And I was getting very bitter about Gilmore girls, like for the right. longest time. And, it, and if any of the fans find this video, they've heard this story a gazillion times. <laughs> uh, because the fans from Gilmore are intense and loyal and will never go away. So don't, right. don't bash them, everybody. They're, <laughs> um, and they, uh, they, you know, I go in and Amy Sherman Palladino, creator of the show, knows my name by heart, has never hired me. Mm-hmm. And I don't know how frustrating of a feeling that, it, uh, just l- letting you know, that, that sucks. Yeah. <laughs> so... Yeah. I come in and I'm like, and I'm just thinking I'm going to drive to Burbank and then have to drive home again and not get this part. I, the bitterness started kicking in. Yeah. And so I was like, uh, just not, not enjoying it. I walk in, the character is an asshole. And I walked in and they're like, <laughs> Oh, hi, Alan. And I said, hi, Amy. Hi. 
<laughs> Hello, Amy. You know, right? Hey, right, cool. Let's do this. And my the part was very much a it was it was an asshole. Uh, yeah. Like, I sugarcoated everybody. The guy was an asshole in the beginning, and um, and at, when I was done, they're like, perfect. <laughs> so it's like, God damn it! You're like, I wasn't even acting. <laughs> I wasn't even acting. I'm just like, you don't want to even be here right now. <laughs> but now that I'm here, all right, family, you know. <laughs> um, but so that happened, and then uh, they they were only going to write us in for three episodes, and that turned into. 15 over two seasons and that was great great fun um yeah so, so cool. what what did you take away from working on gilmore girls what was that experience like gilmore was like the you got to you had a few times to figure out your rehearsal process for tv because mm -hmm. it's a different beast and it's so fast and um and gilmore is incredibly fast talking uh yeah. but like it was a uh i think it was that it's the you need to figure this out because i think everything that the main thing that kind of hit my head was i forgot who taught this lesson if it was at cal arts or um i think it was at cal arts where they're hiring you to know what the hell you're doing you, you're supposed to know it and um nobody's going to tell you how to say something different necessarily or direct you too much. You know, what you did in the audition is how you should do it on set. Well, now I've got the part and I did an audition for, you know, a few episodes later. So, you know, it was like figuring out that process of walking away, finding the truth in the beats, finding what the beats were fast. And um, because you're not rehearsing with people until you show up on that day. Mm -hmm. and, and, and like, hey, dude, you want to run lines really quick? That was rehearsal. Yeah. And, and, um, and so, you know, it's, it's finding that and finding those like moments of like, no matter how uh, much I was geeking out and looking at all the sets and lights and stuff, because I do like that side of life. Um, I had to, I had to figure that out. And, you know, there were, uh, you know, there were other actors that were on there, like Matt Zuccary, uh, he, he's on, Oh, I, the resident was a doctor show on the, on Fox that he's on now. And, um, he played the main boyfriend, Logan, a uh, very disciplined guy. And granted, he had a lot more to do. So, and a lot more writing on, you know, on the audience, loving him for the most part, you know, and, uh, because he was the boyfriend, he, he needed to be, he needed to be the guy. So, but he, he came from where we came from. Uh, I, you know, he wasn't, I don't know which theater school or anything like that, but he definitely took took it seriously and he took the mm -hmm. craft seriously. And um, of the five actors that we acted with the most, there was three of us in our crew. Was, you know, it was that character, you know, Matt's character, mine, and, and this other character played by Tank. Um, and then, you know, Alexis. We were the group, you know, we were the four that were always kind of acting together. Mm -hmm. And I feel like Matt and I were the ones that like, really took it the most serious um i feel like alexis was just like she she had it you know she was she was kind of honing it in and she's been doing it for years at this point five years at this point so you know she knew the character but um but we were definitely like walking away and and you know talking to walls and running the beats and and it's just sometimes you know a few lines of exchange but uh you know finding what that is and what is the real the reality behind it so I think that it was, that was, it was like, you got to find this for yourself and you have to find it fast mm -hmm. um, was the main takeaway. Uh, yeah. And then, you know, and also just seeing like professional television is, is it's fucking cool. And there's a lot of money. Yeah. <laughs> you're like, wow, you're, you guys are doing that. Um, <laughs> so that, that was great. Uh, the revival was better. That came years and years later. Um, shit. 10 years later. And right. They brought me back to be in, there was a revival on Netflix for Gilmore Girls. Okay. And they did four episodes on there and they brought us all back. And they, we did, we did one episode that was, we, I think we were on screen for about 15 minutes, which was great. We mm -hmm. had a lot of scenes going on and, and they spent so much money. Um, that was Netflix. That was not the WB and there yeah. was, and you could see it. It was cool. So yeah, so there was that. And uh, the Gilmore, the original Gilmore, I did that then. And what was happening was um, 
that was towards, you know, the end of me being, you know, tired. I was auditioning a lot and not getting paid and um, only getting some small parts here and there now and then, you know, sometimes once a year, uh, that's, that's no way to make a living, you know? Yeah. And, uh, and, you know, so I was poor for a long time, but still trying it, still going and, and, you know, holding on to some of the, some of those fans, you know, the fan, uh, the, the casting director fans and, and whatnot, and seeing, hoping that something would happen so that when Gilmore happened, I thought, okay, finally, here we go. That's something significant and something's going to come out of this next. And nope, it was like crickets, tumbleweed, and they weren't sending me out as much. And okay, he's on that show. Let's not, let's not think about him for a bit. <laughs> and, uh, you know, it felt like that. And I was already yeah. kind of on my out. So I was like, you know what? I think this is it for now. I'll come back to it. I think I need a break. Um, and it may be a very, very long break. And so I, I, I took that break and I started to try to do some other things. And get you did it. photography, right? Yeah, I was doing some photography then. Yeah. Um, I remember you took photos of very beautiful women. Yes, I did that. Well, I was doing that. I did that after I was taking headshots for a lot of people. And, okay. Um, a lot of I, what I love, actually, that's one of my favorite things is seeing how many people use my headshots as their profile pictures, okay. um, you know, and so I was doing headshots for actors for the longest time. And Trish, what was Trish's last name? Do you remember her, Patricia? I think she was in the class behind you. Wasn't she in Dustin's class? Um, I, I'm not. Uh, it's not uh, resonating right now. Her last name. Anyways, she. uh she wanted me to take photos of her and then she started bringing some outfits. I was like, I've never, never done that before, but I guess you need photos and I'm a dude, so I'm not going to object to this. And when you um, say outfits, are you talking about lingerie? Yeah. Some of it was. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. And, um, and props and she had ideas that she wanted to do. And I, and I said, you know, I don't know what the hell I'm doing, but let's, let's try some things. And we shot, <laughs> We shot some fun stuff and it was, it was all right. It looked okay. And, mm. and then like, and which was great. Cause I was getting bored of headshots and I, I figured it out, you know, and, and then once you figure it out and you have your one location, it's the same thing. It's just a different person the next time, right. you know? Um, and so I was like, you know, I, I, I love photography. I took it in high school. Um, part of that was the film side of me, I like the photography angles and composition and, and framing things. And, and all of that was something I cared about from the universal studios years and then into photography in high school. And did you um, get like a Canon Mark two or three? I wanted one so bad. Yeah. I had no money and yeah. they were like $5,000 when they just for the out. body. Yeah, just for the body when they came out. Yeah, so I knew exactly what that camera was the day it came out. Like right. I, I knew that was a uh, uh, a title, like a, a, an earthquake when that one came out. So the, the reason I know about him is my my uh, employer. I work for Digital Playground, the pornographic film company. Yeah, and he used to shoot uh, for um, Hawaiian Tropic. Yeah, and he dropped his in the ocean. And he wanted me to take it to the insurance company so he could get. <laughs> ah, yeah, that's amazing. Yeah, yeah. No, that camera is incredible. Um, and, you know, when they started doing video on it, that that kind of changed the game for film schools and and, every, and you know, and the whole digital video world, basically. Um, but, uh, yeah, I wanted one so bad. I, I shot yeah. on a bunch of them that I borrowed from friends and and uh, a few of the what was it? That was Mark. That was what was that 5d mark ii and then the 7d a few times and right um, i had a nikon that mm -hmm. was a a whopping five megapixel uh, digital camera um, right which was and, a lot back then oh my god it was the world back then <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> um, and you know a lot of photoshop and and did that and then so trish did that and i thought you know what if i could figure out fashion photography mm -hmm. then I feel like that's the hardest to figure out because there's lighting that you've got to know how to hook up and angle. And then there's a ward, there's wardrobe and a wardrobe person. And then there's a makeup person and 
And then there's this person, this act, this model, not an actor, you know, that you've got to like, you know, get them to do it right. And for me, obviously coming from the acting side, it was always about emotion. Yeah. <laughs> it wasn't necessarily so much about the pose. Sure. It was that, but it was about like, what is your face saying here? What are you doing? What are you thinking about? And I would, even with headshots, I would come up with like the most um, like complex directions just for a headshot, you know, or yeah. I was like, Hey, you know, you haven't seen anybody. You haven't seen the, the person you love for your entire life. It's been many years. Uh, and they were your childhood love. And now you're seeing them for the first time and they're across the room making somebody laugh and you're watching them do that. What, what, what's on your face? And that, <laughs> that was, well, that, you took me there, man. So that was I, the photo. that was a photo. And it was just this like love of somebody that you miss and watching them in their element. It was just this vulnerable, open kind of thing. And that was, that was for headshots. I, I would do a lot with the women on headshots. Right. Um, even with guys, I'd do that too, of like, you know, some of the younger guys. And then, um, but then I started, you know, I started doing the, the model stuff. And I think, um, I think I was shooting, I, I shot Trish and I shot some few people after that. And I kept asking myself, like, I'm, I don't know what's wrong here. Something's not, something's not right. Am I, am I not doing something right? Like lighting wise or, and so I, YouTube University, man. So I started yeah. you know, trying to figure that out and 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 getting better knowledge of lighting and, and whatnot. And then I finally had shot with the professional model from Ford. Mm -hmm. And it was like a Ferrari. I was like, oh, <laughs> that's what I was missing. Right. <laughs> it's like, oh, a professional that does this professionally on, you know, on camera and photographs. And I didn't need to tell them what to do. Yeah. It was like, a, oh, you're you you know what to do. You're telling me what to do. Yeah. Um, and so that was that was awesome. Of like, oh, okay. And so I started getting into that. And those first photos were like incredible. So yeah, I remember I seeing those on Facebook. They were really beautiful. I was uh, like, wow. I was like a multi talented man. That was that was just you know that was my love of vision and like visuals and composition and 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 trying to figure that that out and also like. Can I, you know, directing started with that too, of like being comfortable with telling somebody what to do for us. And so what was the first production you directed? Well, I directed a pilot promo. Um, mm -hmm. I had auditioned for, how did I, how did this come about? Um, oh yeah. <laughs> uh. Oof. One of the, one of the horror stories. Uh, there were a few. Um, but one of the Hollywood horror stories was I was very close to a Harvey Weinstein. Well, yes. And oh, I was just joking. Are no, you I serious? Was I was joking. I was joking. I was joking. Oh, okay. I was joking. <laughs> that was a joke, guys. That was a joke. That's um, so fucking weird. This happened twice today. Exact same type of moment. But anyway, go ahead. Yeah. No. Well, actually, you know, uh, one of the things, one of the main reasons I, I I was getting turned off by Hollywood was that grossness of like agents and their assistants that wanted me to be gross with them. Not like that, but just talk that way and be that way. And I was like, this, yeah. that, that was never me. You know that. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. That's, I remember you were always uh, very respectful. That's, that's, I should say of everyone. Yeah. 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 I was never, I was never that guy. Yeah. And, um, but they wanted me to be that guy. I was like, I'm, this is gross. I'm out. Like I'm going <laughs> to do my own thing. And yeah. um, so at one point, uh, at one point, uh, that was happening, and um, oh, so wait, where where were we? I, I lost track. Uh, it was your first uh, directing project. Oh yeah, so I met Sally Robinson, who was writing a a, a project called Gramercy Park, mm -hmm. and I was up for I was the first choice for this part of this drug addict who left his house and his father was like a successful surgeon and he comes home with a pregnant girlfriend and a whole boatload of problems. And it was an ABC drama and it was gonna fucking change my life if it went on television and right. it, it would have been that thing. And Sally said, I said it exactly how she had written it, which was the best compliment any 
producer writer could give you. And then uh, they gave the part to Milo Bintamilia last minute. I thought it was mine. I actually turned down a, uh. turned down a big Disney job because we thought this other job was ours. Uh, Did you was, mention that when that happened? Yeah, it was. Oof. <laughs> this is a painful story. Okay. So we don't have to go there. If it, you, we if can you're... go there because people need to hear these things. Man. Okay. All right. Go ahead. <laughs> um, it was a. It was like a Disney movie. And it was one of these Disney Channel movies. So, of course, you know, my brain is like, eh, okay, but if that other one is there, you know, that's where my brain was. Yeah. Um, but I had, I had auditioned for that Disney movie and I left. It was the second lead that actually ends up becoming like the star. Of, it was like about a pop star. And I was the manager, but that at the end of it, um, the manager ends up being the pop star. And uh, Aaron Paul was in the, the audition room for that one. Really? I, I used to see Aaron a lot. Now, the, it, now was this post Breaking Bad or? Uh, no, this is pre. This is pre. Okay. Very pre Breaking Bad. Okay. Um, and, uh, and they said, great, Alan's got the part. It's, uh, it pays $30,000. Holy shit, what? Okay. And, but I was in the running for this ABC pilot and the ABC pilot starts to progress and it starts getting closer to testing for the network and the studio. And, and then, um, and Disney comes back 35,000, 40,000, 45,000. Oh, 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 no. 50,000. No. And That's it. Don't tell me 60. No, they stopped. We, we stopped at 50 and we okay. asked, we asked uh, the casting director for the, the ABC thing. Hey, okay. Alan's up for this Disney thing. They really want him. What's going on? Right. Alan is first choice for this ABC pilot. Right. So it was like, oh, fuck. And, you know, it was that, that role that I described versus the other role that I described. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I'm in this position of like, well, shit, what do I do here? And, you know, all my people thought that I should go for the ABC thing. Mm -hmm. And then somehow Milo Ventimiglia was on a contract for Warner Brothers and needed to be on a show to fulfill the money that they've paid him already. And, uh, and they gave him my part and forgot to tell me. Oh, horrible yeah so gramercy park was shot with milo playing my part it did not get picked up and then sally calls me up immediately and said i had nothing to do with that i feel completely heartbroken about this that was not my choice mm -hmm. but we're doing this pilot promo and this is now when that what was the panasonics what was that panasonic video camera which one HVX. Okay. It was like a big, uh, big video camera everybody was using mm -hmm. and digital video. And it was like, that was the first time that people were starting to shoot pilot promos, some scenes, instead of just handing a script to uh, some executives and hope that they read the pilot, they now had some scenes. Yeah. We didn't hire a big film crew to do it. We hired this, a crew to shoot it on this little digital thing. And so, you know, so it was like kind of, you know, quick and dirty, but, but really well done. And we, she's like, I want to do this thing with these people about the Roxy. And um, I ended up playing the second lead next to Milo for that. Um, and we shot it at the club at the Roxy. And it was based loosely based on Adler and this kid who ended up running the Roxy. Mm -hmm. um, and, um, and so that was cool. That was very cool. And I thought, holy shit, they made this pilot. They just had some video cameras doing it and some lighting, but it was really about the script and getting some of the best actors that were in there. Um, and it was a, a lot of TV actors that were doing it with us. So uh, it was very cool. And I thought, you know, I, I might want to do that. Mm -hmm. I always thought like doing the short film route was uh, a thankless route 
Um, you know, you put a lot of effort and time and money into this short, and then maybe you get into a festival and maybe somebody sees it. And, you know, there was a lot of maybes there and a lot of like, I felt like a lot of hoops to jump through where I thought, you know, maybe I do a pilot and a pilot promo. And that way, instead of submitting it to a festival, I'm just going to give it to these producers that I just met and have, yeah. them take, and have them take it to agents and networks and let's, can that happen? So mm -hmm. uh, one of the actresses that was in there, uh, she had hit me up after we had acted in that, that project. And she said, what do you want to do? And I said, I want to make one of those. I want to make a pilot promo. And she's like, well, what do you want to make it about? And I said, I want to make it about six art school students who go to art school and meet each other. And I want it to be an ensemble piece. Mm -hmm. and, um, and each character has like their own reason why they're at art school. And it's always, you know, it's always trauma. It's always some, some backstory to each of them. You know, it's, it's art school. We're all fucked up. So, right. um, so I thought, you know, that would be it. And each of them have different uh, fields of study that they'd be into and just like CalArts. And right. She said, cool. So we wrote it up. We, we, she was very motivated and very like mainstream. She's a little bit on the right. She's actually way on the right uh, <laughs> now, but not, not, not super crazy, but you know, right. uh, and, uh, and she, uh, so, but physical was conservative. About, yeah. A little further. And a okay. little further. Uh, <laughs> All right. Further. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah, it's okay. But what was nice about that was like this duality. It was kind of like balance where I was like, I was going to go for like hard hitting drug addict problems and, you know, like very like emotional and, um, and, you know, big stakes and big, you know, big traumas that these people are coming from. And she had very much like a different perspective and, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, a woman's perspective that I didn't have. Mm -hmm. And um, so I, so it was actually very cool because we were creating these very full people. Um, and we wrote a pretty good script and we gave it to the producer who made the Roxy thing. Okay. Um, and he was like, let's try this. This is a great script. And he ponied up his own money. He put in 20 grand into it. And Alan Barnett is his name. And Alan actually produced the Lifetime movie about John McCain. Um, okay. It was like some doc, like some, not a doc, it was a narrative, but uh, mm -hmm. Alan was like a TV guy, TV movie guy, and he loved it. And so he put his own money up to produce a few pages of this script. And we shot over three days and I got to direct it. And that was the moment where I was like, oh man, this is awesome. I've got, you know, I, I felt more at home at that moment, because I was also acting in it too. And I knew what I needed to get my character there, uh, what, what, I, what my character needed to, to do. And, um, and normally I don't like doing that, Brian. I, I don't like acting in my own stuff, even though I told my younger self that, that right. I would do that. Um, but this one was fine. And uh, I felt like I felt at home and, um, and the crew was vibing and we were in a, in a good place. And we ended up uh, giving that, we ended up getting represented at Endeavor. Um, one of the, the director who did the first thing that I was in the Roxy thing, he ended up giving it to his agent and we shopped it around and I was shopping the pilot promo and the pilot to a bunch of networks and sitting at, like sitting at the other end of a table with executives talking about my characters was one of the most surreal things that had happened in my career for sure. Was like, wow. I never thought I would be in that place doing that. Right. Um, and ABC family almost bought it. They didn't. And then that was the long lesson of you always need a showrunner attached to your television show. If you're going to get it made. Right. Um, we we're trying to get Sally attached to it. She liked it, but it wasn't her, her her style of show mm -hmm. so um so it was just a lot of t or you know at least that's what she told us maybe she hated it who knows i don't know mm -hmm. but uh but like that was that was that process and and learned a lot and then i didn't touch it for a while because it was like okay now i don't know what to do next and i don't have i didn't have like producing and fundraising skills at that point to 
say, hey, I want to do another one, you know, without asking Alan again. So um, I should hit him up. Maybe maybe we'll work on a project. Who knows? Um, there you go. Yeah. But the, go ahead. No, I was going to ask you now when I was directing a huge influence on my style of directing in terms of working with actors came from working with Craig. I wondered if that ever kind of yeah went well through. yeah i think i think definitely brian i think like that second year that was second year for you craig or was that first year craig belknap was first year for me yeah. and then lou was lou palter was my second year so i never got craig mm -hmm. uh my teachers were sherry we were that oh shit okay okay we were that one class that had sherry and bj and ferdinand was our our they were our teachers at first. Oh, okay. Okay. Um, but then, um, yeah, so Sherry's class was, whoa, incredible. Um, mm -hmm. But Lou's class, yeah, I, I think obviously from everything that I took away from CalArts, you know, Lou's class applies the most to the kind of work that we see in the world, you know? Yeah. Um, it's less Travis, more Lou. Sorry, Travis. Uh, <laughs> it was, you know, like we're not doing, we're not doing avant-garde stuff on television. So, right. um, but yeah, I think it's, it was always that it was always a, I feel like with the actors, um, I, I wanted to, I wanted to give them so much that I made it a point. And here is my advice. To anybody writing out there, I just gave this advice to, to a friend of mine whose boyfriend that I know that wrote this pilot. Mm -hmm. And he's trying to get somebody attached to it. And he's trying to do, you know, he's trying to do more. And it's, I think this is one of his first scripts. And, um, and I said, look, you have to write a scene in there that makes that actor that you want to be in this thing, want to do this thing. And um, I feel like I have, a little bit of, of, I had a little bit of an advantage in terms of, I read so many scripts and uh, for auditioning mm -hmm. and I would finish them front to back, all of those scripts, because I had the motivation of thinking, I'm going to play one of these fucking parts. I'm going to play this awesome, incredible part. So mm -hmm. as I'm turning the page, I am seeing myself doing this crazy, amazing piece. And um, and so when I was writing my pilot, I was thinking like, I want there to be a moment for every single one of these characters that is the scene that they play during the Oscars or the Emmys, right? Mm -hmm. You know, it's like, what is the scene that they're going to play yeah. that when they show you your shit? And I made sure everybody had a little chunky monologue that mm -hmm. really kind of poured out what, who they were, why they were there and just kind of made them shine. Mm -hmm. And I, I think that was the trick that got like all of the actors that I had. So I had that in terms of the words. I feel like the words were already kind of there. Mm -hmm. And um, and for me, I was more about being gentle and letting them uh, letting them play. But but I would also like I, I feel like I would just give them the few bits to get get them where I needed that needed them to be. And I think that was like that came a little easy to me of like oh, the, I always thought it was, it was going to be hard of like, you can't give them line readings. How do you tell them what to do? <laughs> you know, like that was always the thing with, with me and directing that like early on, because my high school teacher did line readings early on before we knew what the fuck we were doing. Yeah. She's like, just say it like this. And you're like, why? I don't get it. And she's like, just fucking say it. You know, and then, <laughs> and then we'd do it and the audience would laugh. You're like, and then you'd find some sort of like connection to there. You're like, it, it was a roundabout way of doing it. Um, right. But I think with this, I was so... I, I knew the character so well that it was like uh, just the few things to get somebody there. And then there was like one of the scenes where Lauren, who was the, the, the person that I wrote this with, she had a big crying scene that she needed to do where she's breaking up with the boy and like she catches him cheating, but it's a misunderstanding. Yeah, well, you know, teen drama, teen drama. Right. And, um, and she's like, you know, she was really going for it. And I made sure that like, hey guys, like we're not gonna get a we're not gonna get that many takes of this. So, you know, let's be respectful. You know, it's kind of talking to the crew in a respectful way of like, hey, we're gonna keep this quiet for the next few minutes here, just so she could get this out. Mm -hmm. um, 
And what was cool was everybody respected that and then it gave her the better performance. And then when we hit, hit cut, you know, everybody's looking at each other like, wow, we did something there. Um, mm -hmm. But I think the process for me is, is uh, I, I, think, I think I trust everybody for the most part to, to do it and bring it. But if they're, they're not doing it, I, I feel like I've created such a comfortable environment that if I have something harsh to ask or, or you know, have them do, I don't think that it's going to feel hard for them to get to or you know, try to get them to want to do it for, for the project or, or for me at that time, you know, just being selfish at that moment of like, hey, you know, like, this is what I need this time. So let's try it. But yeah, I mean, I, I think um, that as an actor, for me, what Craig Belknap and Lou Palter did in you know in, in their rehearsal process it was create that safe comfortable loving space and it was a loving space right and i and i feel that's critical for me i know people work differently and i know there's fear-based directing that's, and that's bullshit i hate that shit yeah no room for that sorry everybody who does that but <laughs> but i agree i mean i think the best work you can get out of somebody is through being creating a loving uh comfortable space yeah yeah, and I think I think you would be able to probably get a few more takes out of that kind of moment than like scaring the shit out of somebody and yeah. then having to do ten more takes of that. It's like well, that that sounds like hell. Um, yeah. But also like, you know, the animosity. I, I I learned this from producing was like you keep everybody happy, they'll do anything for you. Yeah. You know, they'll they'll bring it, and yeah. um, you know, if you feed them well. <laughs> <laughs> that crew is going to stay late. <laughs> yeah. Food <laughs> you know, is or, important. Yeah. You know, food's important, but if you, but if you create a safe space for the actors and, you know, I have, I have that playful energy where I'm like, I do that. on. I don't do it on purpose. I mean, it is just me, but I also know like, Oh, this is going to help with everybody relaxing and not thinking this is going to be one of these tyrant moments of some, you know, asshole director who's like just going to demand things and not really be friendly with everybody and it's going to be just a job at that point. Right. Like mm -hmm. for me, I'm like, no, we are making believe we're doing the shit that we wanted to do our entire lives. We're playing make believe and we're filming it. We're playing like, that's the, that's the best job in the world. Yeah. And, um, and so like, you know, I'm dancing, I'm laughing, I'm, I'm walking with them talking about characters, you know, and, you know, and at that point I had done Gilmore, and was actually, I was on Gilmore when we were doing that. So it was a little bit of this thing of like, of, of, I know what you're going through. I know what you have to do. You know, um, you know, I, I'm in this world right now also. And I just so happen to be this director at this moment. So just right. kind of relating to them on the actor side and, um, you know, but always having the answer, you got to always know what, what you're doing and have the answer. And if you don't, you, you try something, but, right. um, yeah, I think that was it. I think you're right. I think it's just that that comfortable place and like knowing that like it is a safe space and, you know, taking Craig's class recently. Holy shit. Yeah. That's exactly right. Because, you know, I had to do I think I may have done my very best work about a year and a half ago in Craig's class, right. like like the very best scene I've ever done where I was shaking and I was like, I don't think I've ever. Ever acted in something that good before, and it was for 12 people in our class. Yeah. And, and I think the other thing that really helps us with Craig is he, you see his excitement, mm. like watching you, right. you know, you can tell he likes it. You know what I mean? Right. And you, he does a walk. You can see him where he'll walk up to you, give you a note and then walk away and you can tell how happy he is. Right. Right. You know? Oh, and he's giddy. Uh, yeah. He wears it on his sleeve. Like yeah. he, he can't hide it Yeah. Um, when it's working and it's going, he's just, that's his, that's his heaven. That's his kid in the candy store. Yeah. Um, I mean, how spoiled is Craig? Can we talk about this? Craig, you are spoiled, man. You get to teach class in this gorgeous backyard of his. Yeah. He married this wonderful man. He's now like just completely dumb and happy, you know, mm -hmm. like, and having everybody show up at his house on the weekend so that he can watch them do plays for him in his house. Like, come on, Craig. Yeah. He, Shit, yeah, that sounds great. Sounds so he, good. He's had a great life. He really has. Charmed, man. charmed life that man. Yeah, so, very special person. Um, we love so, you, Craig. 
We love you, Craig. Love so you. what is the project when you think about right now that brings you the most joy or excites you the most when you think back? Um, Spring Awakening from CalArts. Really? Yeah. That was a good one. How so? Oh, man. Delila, Drago, Megan, Jake, Brian. There was so many great people in that. Now, a- Brian's penis made an appearance in that, didn't it? It did. A wet. Yeah, I, I brought that up when I interviewed him. His penis, uh, we talked about, I talked about it a little too much, but uh, yeah. A, I wet, a wet penis. We talked about that all the time. I think, we, <laughs> I think we still bring it up. Uh, Jake would not let that one go. That was hilarious. Well, also, so, so that the people who are listening, like understand this play was done in the round. So the audience was literally on a circle, on an elevated circle. Mm-hmm. And the entire set was down. So you were looking down. So all of the direction was like, all this whimsical looking up into the sky and talking to the sky because we're kids and we're dreaming and you know all of all of that kind of gesture so that the audience could actually see our faces you know Mm -hmm. lying on our backs and all of that and uh the scene that brian was in you know he got he got wet backstage i don't know why he did that he just shrunk his penis and then they would uh you know he'd come out cold and they hoisted him up to the audience so you're looking down and all of a sudden whoa penis and, uh, <laughs> I remember that. Yeah. Like 3D penis. Like, whoa, you know, like popping yeah. at you, coming at you. Um, <laughs> so <laughs> that was, uh, that was hilarious. But yeah, I mean, I got to act with Drago. You know, we lost Drago in February of last year. And, um, uh, and, and like, you know, that was, he was like, he was one of my besties. So doing that with him was, we didn't get to act in anything until that point, really. Yeah. And, um, and Megan was so great. And uh, my character, you know, that was actually one of the biggest parts that I had at CalArts. Yeah. Um, and um, I just remember like, you know, the monologues that I had were so, it was so raw. It was like the most raw version of myself um, on stage like that. And um, then like, yeah, it was, it was just great. Amanda Gunderson always rem- reminds me of like, she went up on her lines and I barely remember, but I, you know, yeah, I noticed that, but I knew the next chunk. So I skipped to that, skipped to the next chunk and it was fine. Mm -hmm. But she, I remember at that time, she was like, Oh my God, you saved my life. And she did, she did turn white. Like she, she looked at me and she was like, just like white, just completely white. And then I, you know, it was like, fine. I was so, I was so in like, no, I got to do my bit here. Like, this is my big moment. (laughs) Yeah. about to kill myself here um (laughs) so that was uh i feel like that was one of my favorite roles yeah for sure um yeah of everything so was it the um was it just the the cast and and working together or what was it in particular that it was the it was the role yeah uh you know the kid was like so confused and disturbed and lovable at the same time like on the page you loved him like, For those that aren't familiar, can you kind of give a brief synopsis yeah, of the? Absolutely. So uh, Spring Awakening, they made a musical out of it. And this was actually pre the musical. Um, this was like a few years before the musical came out. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's an old German play about school kids in the 1800s. And uh, school was extremely strict at that time. And the dress codes were extremely strict at that time where the girls weren't allowed to show too much knee, too much leg. And everybody was basically doing like 40 to 60 hours of homework and work, you know, a week. And there was a lot of pressure on the children at that time. Um, And the three characters was uh, Melchior, Moritz, and I'm forgetting the the girl character, Megan's character's name. Mm -hmm. And uh, Drago played this kid who was like, he was the lead who he thought he knew. He was the cool kid. He was the kid who he thought he knew about sex and would show like naked photos from like the diagrams of science books um, Mm -hmm. to the kids. And, and my character was like, no, 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 I can't, 
I can't entertain that. Mm. You know, I, I, I have to study. My parents are going to murder me. They're going to kill me. They're going to send me away if mm. I don't do this. And his, uh, my character stress to, to please his parents was like his driving, um, obstacle. And, mm. um, and Drago's character was, you know, this kid who thought he understood sex uh, until he met Megan's character, who listened to her friend tell a story about how she got beaten by her dad with a switch, with a stick. Mm -hmm. And that actually interests Megan's character. So when Drago and her were alone, it, it delves into this little BDSM stuff. Right where megan asks him to hit her mm -hmm. and he doesn't he doesn't even fucking know how to process that we're all children this is all you know coming of age junior high high school kids and um and my character is like can't deal with it is doing bad in school and thinks that that's the end of the world for him and so he actually kills himself mm -hmm. um because of that and uh yeah, it was just some good chunky stuff. And, um, and that director was pretty, he was pretty amazing. Um, and I felt like I got to do exactly what I, you know, what I felt like I wanted to do in terms of being as raw and exposed for that role, I, I got to do it. So um, that one sticks out a lot, a lot. Um, yeah. And there's some fun stuff in the revival from Gilmore. That's some good stuff too, where I buy a tango club and my character has a lot of money, comes from a wealthy family. And, mm -hmm. um, and he's still, a, he's still kind of an asshole, but he's a funny one. And um, see if, if the, uh, I'm not sure, was this the casting director or the director? If she had not kept blowing you off, you wouldn't have been as angry for the, uh, for the audition. And I may have not have gotten. Exactly. So it worked out perfectly. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. For that, it did. Absolutely. Um, Very talented, you? man. What about you, Brian? What are we going to do next? Come on, <laughs> let's, let's work on something. We should. Yeah, man. I'm trying to get back into uh, into it. That's that's what this is all about is me trying to because I went so far away from it. You know, I went uh, I just kind of kept moving from one thing to another, trying to find my path and then. I got to the point where I was, you know, isolated alone in, in, in the mountains, you know, yeah. and like trying to go, what, what do I do next? And I knew all along what I wanted to do, which is I always wanted to perform, make people laugh. And, and, uh, and so this is my, this is my return to that, to Good. find, find the voice again. So, well, yeah. I, I, I look forward to that. I'm, I'm right now, what I'm currently doing is I've been, I was producing commercials at Buzzfeed. Right. And then, uh, two years after doing that, I started directing those. Um, and I did that for about two years. Mm -hmm. Then I started freelancing a little bit, started just doing kind of like digital work, digital video work for companies and brands and stuff like that. I got really good at that. Um, and then, uh, I started working for a company called the dad that makes okay. like dad joke content. And it's a really funny page. Really? Oh yeah. It's pretty now, good. wait a minute. Do you, I, I'm just curious. Have, have you worked with Brian Irwin? at all no well i mean he's a comedian but he, he focuses most of his comedy on on uh, you're saying dad jokes yeah yeah uh this yeah. guy th this guy nick fabiano that i work with now at this other company as well mm -hmm. um we met each other at at buzzfeed and then uh he went and started working for scary mommy which is like the other company of that parent company okay. and um he was like why 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 isn't there anything for dads and they're like, right. what do you want to do? And he started making some funny dad content um, that really went viral right away. And they found the voice, the niche for, for that is like very defined um, and kind of writes itself after a while. I mean, it doesn't, but like, it's, it's like, okay, we know what, what this style is. And it's, it's so funny. Um, and I, I, you know, I was like, you know, for a gig, for a, a nine to five gig that helps me kind of pay some bills and get caught up and try to save some money. Mm -hmm. I, I, you know, that seems better than what I'm doing right now. So that was in New York mm -hmm. that happened. Pandemic hit four months later, uh, Nick left. I was stuck in New York and then that company just kind of, you know, made me want to do more. 
and I started producing and directing at the same time there, not enough resources. So it kind of wore on me after a while. And then uh, there's this company in San Diego. It's a software company. And mm -hmm. the person who is running the creative department, the creative, the chief creative officer, she, she came from Buzzfeed. She came from a company that she made called Cheddar. Mm -hmm. um, and then, uh, and then she brought Nick and Nick brought me and we're like the in-house production company and Nick's doing really funny content for their advertising and, and content, but we're, we're treating it differently. We're not like a company that's hiring an ad agency to do this campaign that nobody gives a shit about. Mm -hmm. We're like, we're like the viral guys from Buzzfeed that like wants to make content that people can relate to and attach to and laugh at. Um, that's and, great. And so it is, it's, it's pretty rewarding. Um, I'm not going to lie. It's, you know, I'm getting to play practice a lot, get, you know, and, and, try new ideas with angles and you know we've got an alexa mini and all the lights and stuff we, we own it i you know I, I bought it over this last year and we're just like playing some good stuff right now so um i'm in san diego it's down in san diego but uh, i just acted in one of the pieces with everybody um mm -hmm. as well as producing it and we're growing fast it's a great company it's called ClickUp. um mm -hmm. And it's like, you know, it's it's project management software that nobody really cares about. But if you work at a company, you do. And right. they're trying to make some fun content and kind of the kind of in that Geico space where it's like you love them, even whether you use them or not. You just love you love the ads. So um, China, you know, we're doing that and it's been a lot of fun. And with and we we're finding some success there. And that's great. But, you know, as you work in commercials, everybody comes or wants to go back to film and TV and make the better stuff. So luckily, um, we're finding ourselves in that position of like, you know, we're loving everybody again. So I'm finding myself in that position of like, there's a family again, mm -hmm. and all these amazing, talented people, graphics artists and colorists and things like that. And, and, um, and we're all talking about our side projects and our side loves. And we all know we're probably going to help each other out with whatever it is that that the, the person who comes forward with a side project wants to do. So um, that's why I'm like, what do you want to do, Brian? Because I'm kind of in that mode of being creative again and wanting to think of like, all right, what's the next one? What's the next, like, I should do another pilot. I should do another pilot promo and try to do that again. So what? Well, we can try to launch my hard life again. Uh, <laughs> yes. You yeah. know what? So for those listening, watching, what happened was, and and this must have, I didn't even know you were, so you were doing Gilmore Girls in 2005? Yeah. Yes. What the, I was so self-absorbed and I'm so sorry. I feel, I feel horrible, but no. I was uh, totally unaware of that, that that was happening uh, because I, in 2006, I had asked you to read, uh, we were doing a reading of um, a pilot we were hoping to get on HBO or uh, Showtime. Yeah, it, it was um, it was basically the main character was me, and I wrote it with uh, two other of uh, my friends, John Huck and Jojo Hen Henriksen. And um, it was about me in the adult film industry and, and 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 my life. And and once again, I had you play my character. Yeah, and um, <laughs> it was a lot of fun, and it was just about. You know, a, 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 you know, a guy like me who has OCD and and you know my problems and being put into this very strange environment of the adult film industry. Yeah. And um, and we took it to New Line Cinema, which is connected to you know HBO. And uh, so we got into the room with the you know the pitch it, and we started to and they're like, oh, we're already working on. Um, with Paul Thomas Anderson on Boogie Nights, the TV show. Oh my gosh. And it was like, fuck, but we're like, this is totally different. And they're like, well, we, the reason we like Boogie Nights is because it's, you know, it's, it's period piece, you know, it's not, you know, so it's kind of like distance from, you know, the current reality. So, yeah. and so we didn't even really get to pitch it and it just didn't go anywhere, but yeah. 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 I mean, that's how it goes, man. It's such a weird yeah. world. Yeah. So, so what, what are you going to work on now? What, what are you thinking about it? Anything uh, you think want to do a movie, you're going to produce something. What do you want to do? Yeah. I mean, I have, um, I have some ideas. I have this other pilot idea that I've got. Um, I actually was working on 
I don't know if you were around for that for Onion Heads. You were. You saw yeah. a second iteration of Onion Heads. You did see a second one of it. Um, so Jesse Miller and I had connected with each other a few years back trying to make onion heads happen. I actually got Mandy and Amber and Banked flew out from Connecticut and had <laughs> done it. Um, and I had, a, had them do kind of a table read, um, sitting down in chairs, but out in a field with like dirt behind them, like, you know, like trying to put them in the, in the space. And we went out somewhere in like Canyon country and, and shot that and right. didn't do much with that because there, the script wasn't entirely there yet. Um, and uh, I think, and, and Jesse was, she's such a powerhouse writer uh, mm -hmm. and, um, and also very like strong willed that she, she had a vision and she wasn't ready for TV yet. She yeah. wasn't ready to adapt the, the story to TV yet and how it would work to elongate it and what, what story are we telling at that point. So there was a lot of conversation back and forth and it was just like, it's just not, it's just not there. It's not, just not ready. Right. Um, but that was one that I really wanted to work on. Um, and I'm still thinking about going back to her because it's been a few years mm -hmm. and this was before like all the streaming had gone, gone viral and come, had come out. So mm -hmm. like before Netflix's shows and all these things. So I feel like now we did have a conversation. I feel like about two years ago or a year and a half ago about, Hey, should we do this again? because I feel like she went to TV school, basically, you know, over the last mm. few years, like a few of us have. So, um, so yeah, that's, that's one project that I'm thinking about again. Mm. I don't have any one that's like leading the charge right now, mm -hmm. um, but I do have some old stories that I want to dust off and, and, and see if I could do something with them. I want to maybe punch some things up because, you know, some of their early storylines are like, that's a sweet, you know, indie biography that nobody's going to watch, you know? <laughs> so like, you know, for me, I, I have a lot of that like producer brain in my head of, of like, yes, we could still have that, but there does need to be some elements in this thing that, that punches things up, you know? Right. And um, that, that comes from the competition side to me of like, I want to tell stories, but I also want to win their hearts. Like I yeah. want, I want it to be something better than just what I'm thinking of. So, um, right. but I would love to play anything you want to write, man. And I'd love to work on anything you'd want to write again. I, I, I truly mean that. So the feeling about. is mutual you, and you have won my heart. And I want to say that, yeah, I would love to work with you if you, if, if there's a part for a blind man and you know, it's, uh, that's the thing that I fucked up on, man, as I like, you know, when I started to lose my eyesight, I was like, I, I can't play the, you know, I want to be a character actor and I want to play all these different roles. Like, how am I going to do it? You know, I mean, just play the, you know, just be blind. And I'm like, but that's the thing, you know, I could have kept doing it and yeah. just, and, you know, so it, it that, that's the thing is that there's always possibilities. And uh, I, I, I want to, before we disconnect, I want to just say that um, I deeply, enjoyed being in your presence at all times. I, I always, I always felt like, you, you know, you always showed everybody respect, compassion and love. And, and, uh, I deeply appreciate that, um, that I'm, I've been in your presence and, uh, we spent time together and, uh, I'm, I'm, and was able to watch you work. I mean, you're brilliant. And I always, always enjoyed it, man. And, uh, thank you. Thank man. you so much. Brian, the feeling is so mutual and, uh, I remember thinking, you know, when you wrote that play and we started working together, I think that that was definitely, we knew each other and we were getting along before that already. Right. Yeah. But that play was definitely our moment. And, yeah. and I, I always was like, one, I can't do this. Yeah, I can't write like this. I can't do this. Mm. You know? And I always looked up to you of thinking, you know, cause I, you know, I've had this young gene, you know, in me. And I looked at you and I was like, that's a man. Like <laughs> it's a grown ass man who knows his shit. And, uh, you know, I, I always respected you. Um, and I thought, you know, I loved your class so much and, and you were always a solid rock as well. I feel like your energy was what you're describing as me, you know, from your class, especially you were, you know, you were definitely 
a lot more grounded. Um, and it, and it felt like that, it, whether, whatever you were going through, you know, like you, it was definitely an illusion because, uh, I was uh, pretty crazy. Yeah. <laughs> but you know, but, but you didn't put that on anyone. And yeah. I, think, I think that was the same thing that you had said to me. I think your presence was always solid, whether, whether you were showing what was going on inside of you or not. Um, I, I love you. And, um, and I know like my connection with you, I can't, I can't put it into words as well. Um, because, you know, I know what my connection is to, you know, other people from that, that era, but for you, you're, you were just a true friend. And, um, and I think that's, I think that that's the best way to put it is that like, I, I felt that from you and you were always so gracious to me and, um, and, and getting to work on that project was, was a treat. Like was, yeah, it's one of my favorite plays from Cal Arts for sure. I, I, and I, you know, and forever I get to tell people I play Frank Sinatra, you know? Yeah. 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 I mean, that, that's what I, I remembered you saying that right before, uh, <laughs> like I graduated, you're like, I, I'm putting Frank Sinatra on my resume. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. And it still is on there. Still is on. <laughs> Man, I, I am, uh, I don't know what to say. I'm, I'm very, profoundly honored by the things you've said and uh, I'll, you know all I can say is a feeling is 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 mutual beyond words and um I, I want to see you man so let's let's stay connected let's do this again yeah. um and yeah. um hopefully I'm hoping that uh, I can get down uh to LA and uh see you and and uh and let's let's reconnect please please Let's let's connect as soon as we're done recording this. And even though the, and the recording's still going. All right. Well, let's have our awkward ending. And so everybody, um, this is Alan Loiza. And um, you can contact him on alanloiza.com, correct? Yeah, there's something there. You could find me on Instagram, Alan Loiza. That's that's another easy way to message me. Okay. And, um, yeah. yeah. Great. So I'll put those uh, links in the show description. And thank you, everybody, for listening and watching. This is The Blind Man in Black. Um, please rate, subscribe, review. It helps. Also, you can watch my wife and I being insane on TikTok, The Exhausting Snyders. So check us out. And Alan Loiza, thank you so much. I love you, man. I love you, Brian. Take care. All right. Let's talk soon. Okay. All right. Awkward ending. Here we go. Awkward ending.